Thank you very much. Uh, everyone's very welcome here. It's great to see so many enthusiastic uh, faces in the crowd. Uh, just to remind everyone that you're very welcome to be here um, and just so long as you don't disrupt or hinder the progress of the meeting, that's the only rules around coming along to these meetings. So I'm going to get started now anyway. Okay, just to advise everyone that we are audio and live streaming this meeting on video uh, and audio uh, on our YouTube channel uh, for the purposes of recording if elected members could wait until I've announced them before speaking and I request that all mobile devices be turned off or put to silent, please. Uh, I'd like to note that there are all members are present except uh, one uh, apology from Alderman Zuko. Uh, and I'd like to start by acknowledgement to country in recognition of the deep history and culture of the place that we are meeting, uh, Nipaluna Hobart. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the determination and resilience of the Palawa people of Tasmania who survived invasion and dispossession. Uh, and continue to maintain their identity, culture and rights. Thank you. Uh, confirmation of our minutes of our last meetings, Monday the 20th of March, Second moved by Deputy is. Lord Mayor, seconded Second. by Councillor Posselt. Are there any comments uh, or corrections to the minutes? There being none, I'll put that. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no, carried unanimously. Uh, transfer of agenda items. Are there any items proposed to be transferred on the open or the closed agenda? There being none, uh, moving on now to item four, communications from the chairman. I don't have any today. Uh, item five is notification of council workshops. Uh, so in accordance with the requirements under the Local Government Meeting Procedure Regulations, uh, the Chief Executive Officer reports that the following workshops have been conducted since the last ordinary meeting of the Council. So on the 27th of March, uh, the, we had um, a workshop on Kunyanyi Mount Wellington Future Directions and also on Budget Workshop Number 2. Uh, the attendance is listed there in the agenda. Uh, and on Monday the 17th of April, we had a workshop on the local provision schedule under the, uh, uh, the planning, Tasmanian planning uh, system, and also briefing on Salamanca market. And again, the attendances are listed there. So that were the two workshops we've had since the last meeting. Uh, now, item six is public question time, and we do have one question that's been put on notice, and so I'll invite the people, if they're here, to come forward and ask their question. There should be a microphone there. So I'm, uh, sorry, I'm Anne Burley and Chris Goggins. Would you like to come forward, Anne? And so just on that, uh, just that microphone. Thank you. If you can just speak into that. Now, that's going to pick up your phone, your voice for the um, the recording, but it won't uh, sound like it's loud. Couldn't hear. Whilst the precinct plan has many good ideas, there is concern that it's simply a mechanism to enable UTAS to move from the Sandy Bay campus to the Hobart Central Business District against public sentiments. There are numerous references, for example, Innovate the Innovation Precinct, which includes such key actions as, four, explore the future desired streetscape, function and character of Melville Street, a theme central to the UTAS move. Moreover, the whole Innovation Precinct has not been a part of any previous documentation, yet it seems to cover over a quarter of the area covered by this plan. We were told at previous consultations about the precinct plan that UTAS would not be discussed, but yet the innovation precinct appears to be set up for them. Question. Will the council record within the innovation precinct plan the will of 22,631 citizens and ratepayers with regards to the UTAS move and respect and honour their no vote? 
Thank you for your question. I think you've directed that through me to the CEO. The question, is that correct? Did you, would, oh. I'll ask the CEO to respond. Thank you, um, Lord Mayor, and thank you very much um, for your question. There's quite a detailed response that I've prepared for you with ass uh, assistance of staff that I will read out um, just for completeness. Um, so you've raised a question about, obviously, this, the proposed structure plan for Sandy Bay and Mount Nelson and also Central Hobart. So I'll just deal with the Central Hobart context first. Um, so, as you know, Hobart has experienced steady population growth over recent years and its population and employment are expected to increase even further in the next decades. So the Central Hobart um, structure plan was really set up to deal with that growth, so its focus is much more beyond that of the UTAS development and, in fact, it's a process that we're going to be rolling out across all suburbs and activity centres within the city of Hobart. So um, UTAS will be a stakeholder like any other business owner or any other industry or um, resident really in terms of these key areas because we're planning for the future of all of them um, and have got a very uh, comprehensive 12-month program to address that. Certainly the community feedback that came through um, the Sandy Bay first consultation and also as a result of the elector poll will be taken into account when developing the structure plan and in fact um, the structure plan which we're calling the neighbourhood plan just for just for clarity, um, for Sandy Bay and Mount Nelson will actually involve extensive community consultation as well. So um, we'll be working with community from both of those communities respectively to understand future aspirations for um, Sandy Bay and Mount Nelson. Um, we're also about to commence a similar process in North Hobart as well um, to look at its future, um, very much based on community consultation and vision for both land use but also for social and economic um, development opportunities as well. Um, but there's a lot more to the specifics that you've raised that I'll provide to you in writing um, in more detail, but that's a, a general response to those questions. Thank you very much. Okay, are there any other public questions from the floor? There being none, we'll move on to item seven, uh, which is uh, deputation, Salamanca Market. So uh, under Regulation 38 of the Local Government Meeting Procedures 2015, the chairperson of a council meeting or a committee ma meeting may invite a person to address the meeting. The invitation may be subject to any condition the council or committee impose. There are four deputations to be heard by the Salamanca stallholders in relation to the upcoming licence review. Stallholders were invited by email on the 17th of April 2023 to submit their intention to make a deputation to elected members at the council meeting. The invitation was at the request of both elected members and the Salamanca Market Stallholders Association. Stallholders making a deputation were invited to speak about the proposed market site fees and the draft licence agreement. All stallholders have received the draft licence and an explanation of how the proposed fees might be applied, subject to Council's consideration of this matter on the 22nd of May, uh, at our meeting on the 22nd of May. The deputations are in addition to the 30-day written response uh, submission period that's been offered to all stallholders and the submission period closes uh, this Wednesday on the 26th of April. So just as uh, for that background, I'd now like to invite the first of the dep uh, deputations from Nadia Tarnese. Come, come forward, Tan Nadia. Uh, so Nadia, it's... Um, Oh, I think I mentioned it's a three minutes. Yep. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nadia Tanasa. I own Simone & Co site 229 alongside my family. I am also the vice president of the SMSA. Prior to owning, I was a casual trader for several years. It wasn't always smooth sailing. On my first day, I only sold $108 gross. It was a total disaster. I quickly re-evaluated and within weeks I was making regular trades, just enough for my husband and I to commit full time at just over $1,000 gross sales a week on average. 
That's a lot less than minimum wage for two adults. We had a kid to support, but we were frugal and made it work. I was still working a casual job, and eventually in 2018, long after I'd quit my casual work, we had done the maths and felt confident in adding a second child to the mix. My daughter, Nugget, nickname, was born on a Wednesday and at three days of age helped me set up the tent for her first full day's trade. There's no time off when the margins are small. My highest selling product is a concrete Tassie shaped magnet. Prior to COVID, I was buying the magnet for 30 cents to glue onto the back of what I had crafted. After COVID and with the war in Ukraine, that same magnet now cost me $2.77. I can't put those percentages into a rise. I know the, HC, the Hobart City Council has rising costs, but many of these are chosen extras. Puppy parking, Salamanca sounds, puppets, sure in theory they create a nice atmosphere, but in practice puppets push the crowd forward and draws customers away from my site. Small artist businesses have small working margins. We're a luxury product in a time when people can only afford necessities. Record numbers of stalls are for sale. Some in danger of being taken back by the Hobart City Council or if they're not sold soon enough. The unique artists of Salamanca are the makers of magic you see when you walk the cobbled streets. We won't exist in five years. Instead, it'll only be large scale producers, food and alcohol, a weekly taste of Tasmania. I'm asking for you to cap the rising fees to CPI with a maximum rise of 10%. Please also consider merchandising. You own the copyright to the Salamanca branding. Every other tourist attraction in Australia capitalises on their branding. I'm constantly asked if they can buy a T-shirt with Salamanca Market logo on it, or a bag, which you can, but not many, cups to reduce, uh, to reduce wastage. Please don't hire a consultant, though. You have artists here left, right and centre. Thank you. I'd now like to call on John Jav Javanovic. Sorry, John, if I right. got your name wrong. Yeah, my name is John Javanovic. Um, I've been at the, at the market since the 26th of February, 1977. <clears throat> I've seen just about everything that one can see at the market. and. Uh, the thing that I have witnessed in the last 10 years it was the <laughs> increasing bureaucratisation that has taken place at the market. Uh, there are some uh, benefits arising from that, but there are also many uh, drawbacks. And I think the council really should give great consideration to that. Um, the the licence uh, agreement that was carried out was carried out in contravention of um, the licence uh, valuation was carried out in contravention of the licence <coughs> agreement, uh, basically because we have, uh, after 10 years, we have this massive document which outlines the uh, relationship between stallholders and the council. And uh, the council uh, should abide by that agreement. And if it doesn't abide by the agreement, it should at least consult stallholders and get their uh, okay to, to vary that agreement. Now, with regard to this latest valuation, that didn't happen. Uh, Section 37A of the 2017 license agreement states quite clearly uh, that the valuation should be carried every five years. It was due to be carried out on the 1st of July, 2022. And uh, that wasn't the case. Uh, this was a uh, decision made by council without uh, consulting stallholders and the valuation was carried out on the 21st of January uh, 2023. Now this was the peak of the market. Uh, this is when most stallholders make their money to last through the hard winter. And uh, the important part is that uh, in that valuation, the, the value was stated that that valuation applies to that period of time and cannot be uh, uh, applied to any other period. Uh, he, 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 he basically uh, absolves himself of any responsibility in regard to that valuation uh, if uh, the circumstances changed. Now the circumstances have changed dramatically since the 21st of uh, January uh, 2023. 
Uh, what we've had is a uh, uh, big increase uh, in uh, decline uh, in not uh, throughout Australia. In fact, uh, <coughs> the decline is uh, set out by Deloitte. It's on the last page of my submission. So that's three minutes. If you wouldn't mind just wrapping up in the next little few seconds. Uh, yes, OK. Um, the, the, the one thing that the valuer didn't do is uh, he didn't abide by the rules of the agreement. In other words, he was supposed to take into account the situation that, as it applies in Hobart. He took into account uh, the markets in Sydney and Melbourne. You're talking about places that have got huge populations, they've got people with uh, much greater disposable income and uh, uh, different circumstances. And it is totally wrong to value uh, the uh, markets in Melbourne and Sydney and compare it to Hobart. Hobart's got only 200,000 people or so. Uh, uh, the situation, the uh, economic situation in Hobart's much worse than in those capital cities. Thank, thank you, John. That's nearly four minutes. Call on Emma Hope from the Salamanca Stallholders Association. Thanks. My name is Emma Hope and I'm the president of the Stallholder Association. I grew up at the market and my late mum Sue was an original stallholder and long time president. I'm concerned the impact doubling our rent and imposing more regulations will have on my business, my fellow stallholders and the institution that is Salamanca Market. So how did we get here? Let's start with the process. There's been a complete lack of transparency, absence of consultation and negotiations, and quite frankly, a veil of secrecy. The valuation report the site fee increase is based on is so flaws, flawed as to be deemed unlawful, not to mention the fact that ordinary storeholders have not been privy to laying eyes on it. We don't know the terms of reference for the valuation, but we do know that it didn't look at trade conditions, storeholder sentiment, or any other measurables that you would expect to see in a reasonable valuation. What it did look at was a site visit during peak season, a comparison of rents uh, from markets around Australia. We're not the rocks market in Sydney. We don't get the foot traffic they do. But by the end of this five year licence, our site fees will be up there with the rocks and more expensive than the majority of markets around Australia. On transparency, storeholders have no oversight of revenue and expenditure despite repeatedly requesting it. We'd like to know where our money's being spent so we can evaluate whether it's being used efficiently. I urge you to read the notes from the workshops that were held in lieu of consultation. Here's an extract from workshop four. It was shared with the group that the market currently pays for itself. Revenue matches with expenses and expenses, most expenses are fixed. If stallholders would like to see more services, revenues may have to increase. I think few stallholders would want to increase in services if they knew it was at the expense of doubling their rent. Elected members have been quoted in the media saying that the additional funds raised by fee increases would allow the market to develop. To them, I would say that over its 50 year history, it has naturally evolved into something that storeholders can be proud of. Yeah. The old saying, if it ain't broke. Uh, talk of increasing the spend on activations misguided. These are too often at the expense, an expensive distraction. At the end of the day, no one's coming to Salamanca to see puppets. They're there for the stalls particularly those who've lovingly handmade jewellery, ceramics, woodworks, clothing and so much more. These are the stalls that won't survive a rent rise due to increasing costs of materials and the time and care that they put into their art, they have slim margins. The stalls doing well despite tough market conditions are the food stalls and distilleries. Increased fees could easily mean Salamanca turns into another taste of Tasmania. For those who've stood up at our forum I pledge and pledge support to support stallholders and have now indicated that they'll vote to increase our rent and impose rigid conditions, I implore you to reconsider. But more than doing it for political reasons, please remember that on top of being the sole income of so many families and a launch pad for innovative businesses, that Salamanca is the creative and economic heart of Hobart. Please don't risk destroying something that means so much to so many. I've already lost my mum and just this month I lost my brother, who also grew up at the market. Please don't decimate my market family. As you can see by those present here tonight, we rally around each other when times get tough.
last deputation is Jennifer Hoy. Good afternoon, my name is Jennifer Hoy, trading as Manning Jewelry at Site 148. I'm a small business owner and make everything I sell at the market. I create unique and quality jewelry that visitors don't see anywhere else. I love what I do and I love the vibrancy of Salamanca Market. I am, however, very concerned about the impact of the proposed draft agreement, including site fee increases, on my business. My margins are already thin and over the last year I've seen the cost of most of my raw materials double. I've so far avoided passing on these costs to my customers because customers aren't buying as much as they used to. Yeah. The increased cost of living is affecting everyone. I don't expect the council or anybody else to prop up my business, but I do think site fee increases should be reasonable. I think future store fee increases should be indexed to the CPI and capped at 10% a year. I'm concerned about the lack of consultation on the draft agreement and the valuers report, despite recent media claims by council that a full briefing was provided to the Storeholders Association. What they failed to say was that the council only briefed the committee members, which has nine storeholders on it. There's 300 plus storeholders who haven't actually received any information about the valuers report. So this has resulted in a lot of storeholder uncertainty and it's actually inconsistent with council's community engagement framework. As site fees fund market operations, I recommend an addition to the draft agreement where council must provide storeholders with an annual financial statement which itemises what site fees are used for, including wages of market crew and office staff, arts and entertainment, administration, vehicles and machinery, and any activities that support government initiatives. My request for accountability and transparency is consistent with our mission statement in Council's annual plan. Council should also demonstrate to storeholders that site fees are being used efficiently and appropriately, or get an independent auditor to do that. The draft agreement contains several clauses which I consider unfair and highly favourable for Council. Clause 56 allows Council to change the size and location of our sites and that we may not make any claim for compensation. I should clarify that I'm only talking about Council controlled activities and not actions in response to COVID or pandemics or extreme weather. As a storeholder, it's reasonable to expect consultation on matters affecting my business and that any reasonable claims for compensation should not be dismissed out of hand. I recommend that management renegotiate with storeholders to revise proposed site fees and terms of the draft agreement because we're a partnership where we can't have one without the other. I would like a five year licence because it provides business certainty. I'm a small scale maker and I provide unique handcrafted goods that make Salamanca, well, I like to think attractive to visitors. <coughs> But the way it's headed though, I just see that craftspeople, we won't be able to afford to trade and you'll be left with the big brand, generic storeholders who sell their goods everywhere. Um, so thank you for letting me share my views with you. So are there any, do any elected members have any questions of any of the deputies? Um, and I'll just need to keep a little bit of an eye on this uh, in terms of time wise, but um, were there any questions? Yes, Alderman Bloomfield. Um, there are nine workshops um, and what was the average participation for those workshops? Question two. Oh, Alderman sorry, Bloomfield. am I supposed to be asking the director, is that right? Or am I asking no, the people? to the deputies. Any of the the four people that oh, presented. Yeah. We can ask the director okay. questions oh, separately. You're right. Oh, sorry. Did anyone else? No. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, the, um, the nine workshops were never sold to storeholders as being, you know, the crux of, of our licence negotiations. That was never the case. I think if it would have been emphasised that that was the case, we would have had a much higher uh, attendance. The average attendance was 15. So 15 storeholders out of 300, so it's really not a reflection of the views of storeholders. So yeah, a lot of, and you know, yeah. uh, and they, on top of that, they were held at the old wool store in expensive hired rooms. Um, yeah, and we were told to, you know, give our pie in the sky, you know, whatever we would want to happen down at the market, not if you pay increased fees, you could possibly get what you're, what you're wishing for. So there was, yeah, a little bit of 
underhanded. I don't feel like that those uh, workshops were, were sold as what they ended up to be. Yeah. Any further questions, Councillor Dutter? Uh, th thank you, thank you, Chair. I, I have a question to uh, John Javanovic. I hope I pronounced the name correctly. Yes. Sorry if I haven't. Um, you, you mentioned that uh, there was a breach in the evaluation process. Now, in the agreement, were you supposed to be consulted? And were you consulted? Did you respond to participate or not? I wasn't consulted. Um, to start, that's the first thing. The second thing is that... Um, Miss, uh, would you mind coming closer to the... Uh, sorry, I, I wasn't consulted uh, at all. Um, and uh, secondly, uh, Section 37A uh, double I clearly states what the criteria are for the valuation, and these these weren't uh, uh, done. Uh, and um, and by just by that very fact, the valuation should be regarded as um, null and void. Uh, <laughs> just add to that that uh, the SMSA were invited to do a further valuation but given that they we were told it would cost ten thousand dollars and we don't have that sort of money we were unable to but certainly had we been able to and had we have the funds we definitely would have uh, given that we would have known and had uh, foresight over the those terms of references for the valuation because we feel that the one that was done uh, was very inaccurate due to the limited um, terms of reference Okay. Um, so if there's no further questions, I'll one quick one. Yes. Um, just uh, to whoever's best placed to, to answer it. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, to whoever's best place to, to answer it, what's this? I suppose each, each store would be different, but how much, or what proportion of your daily costs for running the store are made up in those fees? or what? Uh, and also, what. If a fee increase is to be expected, what would be reasonable to, to, to all of you? Uh, I think uh, for all of us, our costs are varied because our businesses are so varied. I mean, we've got, you know, growers and makers. It's, it's, it's hard to say, you know. Um, for someone like a maker, I mean, I said before, we make roughly $1,000 a week gross for two adults. We've got two kids to support as a full-time business. Uh, the extra fees is a significant percentage of my business. I have friends, and, and I can't tell you what their businesses are, but we're all, we're all makers, we're all artists. Um, the percentages that we're talking is going to mean that they won't be able to buy coffee from fellow food vendors, from storeholders. They won't be able to hire tables. Um, I've actually stopped hiring a table because that $10 a week is too much for me now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, they won't, they'll be walking much further afield because they won't be able to pay for parking to be close by. Um, they won't be buying their jams from their local suppliers and they won't, um, they, they just won't be able to support local anymore. So there's 300 traders and 300 traders won't be able to support their friends and families at the market by buying local. They'll be going to Coles and spending three bucks on a jar of jam instead of nine dollars on something that's you know, much more sustainable on something that's, you know, much more sustainable and nourishing for their families. So, a lot. Thank you. <laughs> really. I hired two tables uh, up until very recently. And uh, I, I found that it was just too much, so uh, I stopped hiring those tables, and I was charged a fee of $36 to stop hiring the tables, which I think is outrageous. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, so um, that brings to a close the deputations. Um, would someone like to move that those deputations are received and noted? Yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. I'll, I'll move that they be received and uh, noted and thank those who, who came along tonight and for their deputations as well. Moved by Deputy, seconded by Councillor Dutter. I think your hand up was at first. Uh, all those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. Carried unanimously. 
So thank you everyone for coming. You're very welcome to stay if you'd like to, but otherwise um, we'll now be moving on to other agenda items and we'll be in touch over the next uh, month before the council considers this matter. Item eight is item eight is petitions. We have no petitions. Mine is. Please leave quietly so we can get on with our meeting. Okay. Consider uh, item nine is consideration of supplementary items. I think we have none in the open meeting. Consideration of pecuniary Hello. and conflicts of interest. Would any uh, members like to indicate an interest in any item appearing on the open council agenda? We will now move on to the first officer report, which is uh, item 11, the draft waterworks reserve master plan. Would someone like to open this matter or move it? Moved by Councillor Sherlock, seconded by uh, Councillor Harvey. Any discussion? Councillor Posselt. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, so the, the plan overall is, is really good. Uh, this is a, a highly utilised site, um, and it's obviously serves a practical purpose in terms of its provision of clean drinking water to the people of Hobart. So using it better is always a good thing. Um, there's a couple of concerns that I'd just like to note it on the agenda, um, or on the minutes, sorry, which is uh, page 55.3, removal of trees and vegetation to open up a view line. Um, potentially some further information regarding what sort of trees we want to remove um, to provide a view would be useful. Um, and second to that, uh, I'd propose an amendment um, to the document, which is around the communication strategy on page 15, 12.1, the list of residences to, to be supplied with consultation letters to be expanded to include uh, the northern border of the reserve, which is residents that are on the southern side of Hewan Road, uh, who I know are, are heavy park users uh, because of their proximity to it. I think it's only fair to include them in the de or in the more sort of concentrated consultation. Um, otherwise, uh, the only other point is um, the expansion of a shared use track uh, requires further assessment in my view. Even as a mountain biker, I don't think that this track is particularly wise to become shared. I think we should probably keep it as a um, as a, a walking track only, but that'll come out in consultation, so. Okay. Thank you. So just the one request. The one, the one amendment, formal uh, amendment, Lord Mayor. So we need a seconder for that amendment. Just include it. Yeah, just a to include it. Inclusion. To include it, so yeah. the motion will acknowledge the uh, addition of that extra group um, in the page 15. Any other discussion? Look, can Thank you, Chair. Um, look, I visit the Waterworks a lot. It's great to see this document come out um, and that we're moving on with managing this, this asset. I've just got a couple of questions. Um, does Taswater share any of our costs in re relation to the shared sort of use of roads and other, other infrastructure? Uh, through, uh, through, through me to Councillor Mr. Noy. Yes, um, no, they don't. Thank you. Uh, and the other question is just about the, the weed outbreaks. Um, there is a small mention in the document about some fairly bad outbreaks on the upper reservoir track, um, but it doesn't really say much about what's happening there. Uh, I just wondered through you again whether we could just get a little update on what's happening because they were pretty, pretty widespread last time I was there. Sure. And is that whether the master plan will address weed, uh, address weed management? Is that what you're seeking? I guess yes, and whether anything's happening at the moment, given the, prox the, the widespread nature of the outbreaks. Um, Snow, would you like to respond to that? I'll um, refer that to Ms Hickey, uh, the author of the uh, plan. 
Thank you. Um, through you, the Chair, I, um, the Lord Mayor, it's the, the weed management, the detail of it will be um, come down to smaller plans. So basically, we, the main areas where there are weed problems at the moment are on Taswater's land around the reservoirs. And what we hope to do is to negotiate a memorandum of understanding with them to have some progress with um, managing those weeds with council officers undertaking that weed work because the expertise lies with the council. So I think it was pointed out in the plan that there are considerable expansion of um, Spanish Heath and also Foxglove yes. within might, the Taswater area. Up, so there's a lot of thistles up there. So. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. So, I'm just wondering, um, Councillor Loberg, were you, do you want recognition of the need for an, the MOU to be factored into the master plan as well? Uh, sound like it's necessary, okay. uh, Chair. No, no as just, long as it just interested to yeah. see that it was being managed, and it sounds like it is. Um, I guess my final point would just be to back up what Councillor Porcelt said. The upper reservoir track, I walk it a lot. You often walk past families. In fact, every time I go up there, I do large family groups with ad older adults and little kids. I just don't think it's a suitable shared bike track. It's got some really nice flat walking there and as I said every single time I've walked that track there have been large family groups on it who are walking so I just want to back up what he was saying uh, Councillor Possett was saying about that it's uh, I prefer that remain as a walking track only sure. uh, I'm just wondering this will come back to us for finalisation just a draft isn't it yeah. um, yeah. Lord Mayor, um, thank you yeah I just wanted to do a bit of a comparison here with the work we've <clears throat> completed at the domain, for example, with the, the barbecue area up there, which I think is quite sensational. The design, the materials is, I think, very impressive. I just wanted to ask through you, are we, should I be expecting something of similar quality at Waterworks Preserve? Uh, Mr Noy? Um, through you, Chair, that depends on the, uh, the financial um, <laughs> contributions that we manage to attract for this uh, project. So it really does depend on the, the, the budget. That leads into the next question. How much, what, what's the budget for this and how much do we need to acquire and how will we acquire that difference? Sorry? Yeah, look, um, the overall uh, uh, indicative cost is $10.5 but that's uh, over a 20-year uh, time horizon. The significant uh, component uh, with the visitor uh, shelter um, is um, pushed out to uh, a 7 to 20 year time frame uh, and that will be dependent on um, achieving funding from grants and the like from other levels of government. But after this consultation this will be a shovel ready project which makes applying for grants a bit easier than having a really great idea. I think you've I think you've answered yeah, your I question. Know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Deputy Lord Mayor. Yeah, thank you. Through you, Lord Mayor, to Mr. Noy or to Ms. Hickey. Uh, just in relation to just following on from Councillor Loberger's question in relation to to Taswater um, contributing, do we have any other arrangements in any other of our uh, parks or or gardens where um, Taswater is contributing to the upkeep? of our tracks? Through you, the Mayor. Um, not to my awareness, but there are some very interesting agreements that have been made with TAS Networks up at Knock Lofty Reserve, and the Bush Care Group up there is, is funded by TAS Networks to maintain the way leave easement. So there are some creative ways of doing that, but with TAS Networks, no. Just to, um, uh, about five, to six years ago, Taswater used to contribute $120,000 towards the upkeep of the reserve, and that then came to an end, and there has been no agreement since then. Well, thank you for the answer. And I think, uh, Lord Mayor, um, certainly I, I believe that we should be pursuing uh, some of these things. I mean, this is, this is a, a very important... Um, uh, very important that this this reservoir or these two reservoirs are, are, are kept and, and um, you know are, are secure. Um, and if there can be some sort of arrangement with financial um, um, 
contributions. I think that would be good as part of the MOU. I also um, I commend the report. I really appreciate the, the, the work that's gone <coughs> into this uh, and the, the detail. Uh, I too was concerned about the, the weed management, but um, also feel that those connections with other parts um, and tracks coming in uh, are part of, the, of that uh, ongoing story and connection to the rest of, of um, the, the suburbs around Waterworks Reserve. So I look forward to, to this, um, uh, or the contribution and when it goes on exhibition. Now this isn't part of a strat statutory planning process, is it? Is it just, okay. Why? No, it isn't. Right. All right. Thank you. So, yeah, highly commend this and, and really hope that they're, given that this is such a, a popular uh, destination, uh, that um, that we advertise very heavily and get uh, a lot of input from, from community members. Okay. Any further discussion or questions? If there's none, I might ask one or just make a point about um, the map on page 36. Um, which does have all the tracks and it does, I do think we've made it a little bit complicated. I mean, I also note the comments about shared use tracks, but just in terms of, um, I guess, recreation management, having that much diversity of tracks and that many different types of tracks within a fairly small area, I think could be um, challenging. And also just to note that the last two items on the keys, which is um, proposed children's cycling training zone and walking track, they're both blue dotted lines, but I wasn't sure, are they the same track or? Um, through you, the Mayor, it's, um, it's a bit a colour issue. Uh, the, so basically the blue track and the lower reservoir track is blue and it's a walking track only. Yeah. Whereas the green, which is a very small strip, where the, we're proposing that road be shut is for children cycling training purposes, and that's green. So we, it's a colour issue that's going on. Is that, uh, okay. Does that answer your question? I think so, yeah. So the, right down the very top of the map is the, where it looks black. Is it's right up at the upper reservoir uh, at, that I'm looking at, which is the green, which is the fourth um, dotted line. Um, in the key, which says proposed children's cycling area, that's the green area, and the blue area is um, the lower oh, res I see. I see, reservoir I see. track. Yep. And it is, we did identify that the colours are actually difficult to distinguish. Sure. When they're, yeah. Yeah, so when it goes out to consultation, you might, you know, need to fix that, maybe. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay, if there's no further discussion, I will put that, all those in favour say aye. Aye. Again, say no. Carried unanimously. Uh, item 12 is Crowther reinterpreted amendment addendum, sorry, to the Franklin Square Conservation Master Plan, moved by Councillor Harvey, seconded by Councillor Sherlock. Uh, discussion? No discussion. Uh, uh, Councillor Elliott? Yes, I have a um, question, please, uh, probably for the planning director through you, Chair, about. Uh, the timing of, I imagine this, well, with this motion will pass tonight, undoubtedly, um, when we can expect the removal of the bronze component to come before planning committee. Mr Noy. Uh, through when you. the DA would be coming forward. Yeah, uh, well, when it's lodged, uh, Lord Mayor, but I might uh, refer that to... Oh, the sorry, that goes to um, the Director Cooper. Through you, Lord Mayor, in the next couple of weeks, the DA will be lodged. Okay, thank you. And given that is so soon, uh, I've has there been any contact with um, Navinia in Battery Point? Because I have heard from multiple of um, uh, Dr Crowther's descendants that that is a location that the family would like to be considered as the new home for the statue. Um, I would have gone into that um, in more detail, but given it's going to come before planning so soon, has there only been discussion with the Minimum and Battery Point about that being a viable option for the bronze component? Director Cooper? For you, Lord Mayor, not directly, no, but we can take that on notice and do so. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll talk to the motion, but I would also then propose an amendment to this um, recommendation that the Council asks officers to pursue conversations with Nurinia with some urgency so that 
uh, we could potentially have, if it's viable from both sides, have the bronze component moved directly from Franklin Square to Narinia with no time in any back cupboards gathering dust. So uh, I'm not sure if that's an amendment we vote on. It's been noted by the officers and it's probably not directly related to this. But if you've got a seconder, we can vote on it. Um, is there a seconder for Councillor Elliott's? Alderman Barakas. So the amendment is to add in that the officers um, consult with urgency with Nirinya about the potential of the bronze component going to that location. Okay, so that's an amend amend amendment before us. Um, uh, would you like to speak to the amendment any further? Or? Um, I only have limited knowledge of uh, that at the moment because I wasn't expecting the plane to come on so soon. I've been focusing on the addendum. But my understanding is that Dr Crowther had a large role in actually setting up Nirinya in Battery Point and uh, there's a lot of history behind that and articles which I don't have with me and would happily provide at a later date and to the administration as well. Uh, but in discussions with, I said, multiple descendants of Williams Crowther who are obviously highly um, upset and distressed not only about the council's decision but also about the process um, and the tarnishing of the family name, but that uh, the Nirinya site is one that the, that the family would uh, feel comfortable in the situation with it being pursued as a, a new home for the statue. Okay, any further discussion on the amendment? Um, I might just make a quick note myself that I think Narinya is part of TMAG um, and I know our officers are certainly in discussions with TMAG so they may not be able to be divided as they are sort of part of the same organisation. So, anyway. Uh, okay, if there's no further discussion, I'll vote on, we'll vote on um, Council Elliott's amendment. Um, all those in favour say aye. Aye. Against say no. Show of hands, all those in favour. I think we've got Alderman Barakas, Councillor Elliott, Councillor Kelly. And against? Bellot, Councillor Possel. Um, sorry, it was Councillor Bloomfield. Sorry, Alderman Bloomfield. Did you? I'm staying, thank you. No. Um, Councillor Dutta, Councillor Harvey, Deputy Lord Mayor, and the Lord Mayor. So, declare the motion. The amendment is lost. Uh, three votes to. We've got, I'm missing somebody. Uh, I think it was, I think it was Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Four, so four votes to seven, the motion's lost. Thank you. Um, Councillor Elliott. Thank you. Uh, so I'll keep this short, but from my perspective, in 2007 there was a council, uh, the Franklin Square document, very clearly states that the William Crowther statue is of high significance. Fast forward to today in 2023, which isn't really that long ago, 2007, and it detracts from Franklin Square. So what's changed in that period? From my perspective, um, nothing has changed. Some people have complained about it. Some. Not all of the Aboriginal community as uh, misled in 4.1. Some of the Aboriginal community have complained about the William Crowther statue. The um, Aboriginal community up in Circular Head Aboriginal Corporation strongly want the statue to remain to the point where they're seeking a federal inquiry through uh, one of the senators on this whole matter. Um, people I've also spoken from the Aboriginal community in the Huon who also want the statue to remain. So 4.1 is incorrect, it's only some people. 4.2 in the background report is also um, reinforcing information that's incorrect, but I've done a whole item on that so I won't go there again. But Again, I'm really disappointed in this situation because nothing has changed since 2007 apart from some people finding something offensive. So of course we'll have a slippery slope there of what else is going to be cancelled next. Crowther in that time has not been found guilty of anything. No further action has happened. And this is just clearly another virtue signalling council opportunity. Thank you. Further discussion? Councillor Sherlock? Oh, you go first. No, no, you're right. No, you're right. Um, Alderman, look, no, Alderman Bloomfield. Yeah. Okay, look, I, I'm, I was trying madly to find exactly the point in the report. There's quite a lot of words there. But what was really interesting was that, that this was originally identified as a Victorian I think, era. 
with um, statues to that period. And what was interesting was that um, they actually specify in these reports that these statues are in fact not rare. I was quite um, confused with that because I don't know particularly where else such statues exist. So I had a question in that, um, what is the definition of rare and, um, and of how many statues are we talking about that this one is one of apparently many not to be rare? Uh, Director Cooper, did you want to respond to that one? Uh, it's just seeking clarification about the rare, the comment that in the report that it says it, it's yeah, not rare. Yeah, through you, Lord Mayor, I would, it's in the Heritage Consultant's report and we would need to seek her advice in terms of what the specific Take boundaries that on notice, are. Please. Take that on notice. Um, so might not know before you vote Alderman Bloomfield, but maybe for later. Uh, when you're voting on the DA, you'll have that information. Uh, did you want to say anything else, Alderman Bloomfield? No. Uh, I think Councillor Sherlock was next. Um, thank you. I'm just going to be really quick, um, just with regards to cultural significance. That point was raised, um, um, and, and things do change over time, and I think it's really important for us to note that. Uh, in fact, at page 114 of the report, um, it talks about um, how cultural significance changes over time. So if something was important in 2017, maybe in 2023 it's not. Um, and I think it's really important to note this sentence. Uh, it says, the need to periodically reassess significance is acknowledged within the Barra Charter, which notes that cultural significance may change over time and with use understanding of cultural significance may change as a result of new information. I think it's really important to note that. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Yeah, thank you. And I'll, I'll uh, reiterate what uh, Councillor Sherlock said on page 129 in uh, the report under significance. It states, when considering this contribution in the context of cultural significance, it is our assessment that the contemporary social community and political sentiment regarding the Crowther monu Monument detracts from the values of Franklin Square. The Crowther Monument is a contributory feature of Franklin Square, not the main thing, um, against Criterion C, in that it is a Victorian monument consistent with the commemoration of public figures in civic parks, as was the practice of the day. However, the Crowther Monument is not essential in understanding Franklin Square's characteristics of a Victorian inner city park. The significance of Franklin Square is not directly associated with the Crowther Monument and would still meet the inclusion threshold in its absence in a historical or contemporary sense. So, Lord Mayor, um, I think this is the next step uh, in uh, getting to the point where we do remove the, the uh, Crowther statue. Of course, this needs to to, to be considered in, in this context, um, but uh, I was certainly uh, was very pleased to, to see um, so many letters in support of, of this uh, addendum. Any further discussion? Uh, all <coughs> um, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, I won't um, repeat comments that have been had on, had on this. Um, in, in the past when we've uh, debated this issue. I, I will just note that I do, I do think it's interesting that we live in a day and age where a um, uh, very old bronze statue uh, commemorating a, a very famous, but for better or for worse, um, leader of our state is deemed to be not of heritage value or, or cultural significance. Uh, and yet we also have very often debates in this chamber um, arguing that non-heritage listed buildings that are barely visible from the street um, are of heritage significance. It, it just seems that, look, I'm, I'm entirely certain that if we applied the same high standard to heritage significance that's being applied to, to this statue, um, to uh, general properties around this city, then much more housing would get built and many more DAs would get approved. Um, but but there just that does appear to be a pretty significant inconsistency in the way that um, the the label of heritage and cultural significance is applied, um, because at, at, at the end of the day I'll, I won't be supporting this, not to, not to surprise anybody, but th this uh, this does and is in my view 
uh, tantamount to modern day book burning, and I won't be supporting it. Further discussion, Councillor Dutta. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. The uh, motion in front of us is, for me, is very simple. Uh, and I just want to make one point in the way that I understand it. Uh, this is simply a step in, in a particular process. And to approve the addendum as it is in the motion, um, we are not in any way triggering the removal of the statute. That is uh, not what we're asking here. What we're simply asking is that once we approve this addendum, it then allows us to go to the next step to make sure that we are able to submit a planning application. Thank you, and for that I will support this. Councillor Dutta, any further discussion? Councillor Kelly. Um, I wasn't on council when this uh, issue was raised, but I, I did watch it closely. And I've received a lot of feedback from uh, people during my campaign and since then. And I also read in great detail the um, report that uh, Kate Warner did for the state government as far as um, the treaty, it's not reconciliation, it's a treaty that we should be adopting moving forward. And one of the things that really came away from me there was that uh, the Aboriginal people were saying, look, we've got to move forward together. If, unless we can do this together, if there's a victor there and someone who's not happy, it's, it's, it's a it's a pyrrhic victory and it's one that doesn't really bring the community together forward. One of the big things is that I've had feedback from people saying, look, it's not so much whether the statute remains or not. Why is it that in isolation, one statue is being picked out amongst all the statues, the plaques, um, and, and, and all, all the other objects around our municipality in Hobart, and it's taken two to three years to get this process through. What's going to happen with another statue or another sculpture or another plaque. Is this going to just continue to happen like this? And therefore, perhaps the proper way to do this would have been, as probably a normal business practice would be, to look at things holistically and look at the pause, look at everything that this municipality has, do the proper study on it, and that's it. And then we can all move forward together. You may not quite support it but uh, or agree with all of that, but at least a thorough and comprehensive He's done on what we have with assets like this in the municipality. An intelligent decision is made, and then we won't be going down this very, very divisive track again with every other single monument, plaque, statue that we have. And I think it's uh, a poor reflection on the way this whole issue has been handled, despite what your opinion on the on the removal may may not be. Thank you. Any further discussion? Just, uh, I just want to respond to a couple of points um, raised by Councillor Kelly. Just, um, I guess, just to say that the process that um, has taken place up until this point, I would consider, has been pretty comprehensive uh, in terms of um, the, the reason for this particular statue being identified as particularly problematic for the Aboriginal community um, was identified quite some years ago and it's been a been reminded uh, um, the council's been reminded of that um, on many occasions by the Aboriginal community including as part of our reconciliation action plan uh, that we uh, agreed to I think in 2019 uh, and then there was quite an in-depth um, public art project which commissioned four pieces of art and got the conversation going um, there's been a lot of um, uh, submissions written, including by uh, institutions like the Royal Society and um, the Australian uh, Historians Association, all of which um, perhaps we can circulate to new elected members, because this, this was all before the last election. The representations made um, on the night that we made the decision were really informative. I think they're still on YouTube. But again, um, really informative deputations from uh, Professor Greg Lehman, from the Royal Society, from um, the Historians Association, from the Tasmanian Aboriginal uh, Centre. So I think there's been quite a lot of thought and a lot of, uh, a lot of the discussion, um, people identified that this wasn't an easy decision, 
but on, um, but it was a, a, a decision on principle, and you know people can see that there are two sides to every story, and I guess everything that's every sort of change that's meaningful and um, different will have division and different points of view, but that doesn't mean that you don't uh, need to sometimes make those tough decisions where there are uh, different views. But I just wanted to say that I do think that the process around this has been very sensitive, well considered, and you know, some people would say we should be moving faster, but we've still got many more steps to go in the process. Thank you. Um, so, all those in favour say aye. aye. Can say no. No. Show of hands, all those in favour. Councillor Sherlock, Councillor Possum, Councillor Loberger, uh, Councillor Dutta, Councillor Harvey, Deputy Lord Mayor and the Lord Mayor. And against? Gordon Barakas, Councillor Elliot. Bloomfield and that uh, Alderman, sorry, Councillor Kelly. Uh, declare the motion is locked. Sorry, the motion is passed. Seven votes to four. Thank you. Um, item 13 is the Tasmanian Travel and Information Centre. Fees and charges for 23 24. Would someone like to move the recommendation? Uh, moved by, uh, move by Councillor Harvey, seconded by Councillor Dutta. Any discussion? Councillor Posselt. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, look, I'll, I'll keep it brief because I've circulated some stuff with the executive and with um, elected members. Uh, just about um, uh, interest in how we operate the TTIC, including advertising fees and charges, which is why I was hesitant to vote for this particular uh, vote in support of this particular recommendation. Um, I think that uh, we just need to consider at the council level uh, uh, what the strategy will be moving forward with the TTIC, uh, noting that some of these um, rates seem to be uh, well below commercial rates, uh, which is fine if that's a council decision uh, to take moving forward from a strategic direction perspective. Uh, but I would like to see a comparison of these rates, a direct comparison with these rates to other commercial providers, if that's able to be uh, provided for our next financial year's decision. That's all. Thank you. Okay. So would you like to move that as an amendment? No. That's fine. Just comment. All right. Any further discussion? I'll put that. All those in favour say aye. aye. Again, say no. Carried unanimously. Item 14, uh, new council policy on the internal audit charter. Moved by Deputy Sorry. Lord Mayor, seconded by Councillor Harvey. Any discussion? No discussion, I'll put that. All those in favour say aye. aye. Again, say no. Carried unanimously. Uh, item 15 is the draft public interest register policy uh, that. Um, would someone like to move the recommendation? Deputy Lord Mayor, seconded by Councillor Posselt. Uh, so that's been moved. Any discussion on the policy? There being none, Councillor Dutta? Uh, just a question um, through you to uh, whoever will be able to answer this. Uh, I, I was wondering, is it possible to also include in there uh, the Public Interest uh, Disclosure Act 20, uh, 2002? if there's any relevance uh, with the policy and that particular act. And also, uh, if the uh, Local Government Act section 51, 54 and 56 could have a linkage with this. Uh, just a question for clarification. Uh, who's this? Uh, Ms. Uh, Director Reynolds? I would have to take that on notice to look at those linkages and uh, crossovers into the policy advice on that matter. Thank you. Any discussion? Any further discussion? Council uh, Alderman Bloomfield. I can't read my screen tonight, but um, having read it earlier, um, I really would like to see a little bit more clarification on the types of investments and so forth, because um, some of it's what I would... Talking about the public interests. Oh, uh, sorry. Which p part? Oh, of the section. I, I can't even read the numbers at the moment. It's the the screen is so bad. 
Um, Shareholdings, trusts, property. In that section where it interests, I think it says number two. I, I, I really can't read the darn screen. Yeah, number two. Trustee or beneficiary of. Yeah. So, so the thing is that the way it reads to me is a little bit overly simplistic. Um, in that, um, beneficiary of a trust. That's great, but it doesn't actually look into the trust to see what the trust is doing. The trust is investing in <coughs> shares or business here or anything like that. There's no look-through provision. I think that's what we, that's what I call it in my world, look-through provision. Um, so we don't have that in this. So I could say, well, I've got the Daniels Family Trust. And you'd go, that's great, Daniels Family Trust isn't interesting to us, um, it doesn't, doesn't meet any of the problems, that's fine, except inside that trust are an awful lot of stuff that is of great interest. So we can't actually see, we're not actually asking to look inside. Um, so, so there was that. The other element is when it actually says $10,000. Now, if you've invested in an investment, um, how are we qualifying $10,000? Because I can buy something at $1,000 and six months later it might be worth 10 or it might be worth nothing. And then three weeks later it might be now worth nine or it could be worth 15. So I would like clarification of how often do you want me to establish why I've invested and what value should it be defined and is there going to be like a reporting limit if it suddenly climbs to $100,000, how many days do I need to have before I must report that to you? How much, how, how over this should I in fact be? It might sound <coughs> rather grand, what I'm saying, but I, I promise you it's, it's that small detail that I believe will make quite a difference of this. Thank you, Alderman Bloomfield. Um, I think the CEO wanted to make some clarifying comments. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor, and also um, thank you for your question, Alderman Bloomfield. I think what um, we need to remind ourselves of here is that this is a policy of the Council or a recommended policy of the Council. It in no way, um, I guess, overrides the Local Government Act provisions, so I think we just need to be mindful of that. Um, those specific matters that you've raised, I really do think we'd need to take them offline and really workshop those with you as an individual and I think something that we could probably do, um, you know, as we sort of iterate um, this policy over time, um, because you've raised a whole range of things that I just don't think are really covered here in the way that you're describing. Um, so perhaps something for us to just take away and, and have a think about. Um, but my uh, recommendation, Lord Mayor, is that it doesn't necessitate a withdrawal of, of this item, um, but merely we press on, but provide some more detail at a later time. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, just a question through you to the CEO. So this, this is effectively based on the parliamentary standards that we have, are they? Sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, so, uh, are these uh, standards, like this public interest um, uh, policy, is is um, aligned to the state parliamentary policy? It's broad, through you, Lord Mayor, it's broadly aligned. It's based on a number of jurisdictions that we've reviewed and researched and adopted what we consider better practice. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yes, I um, had cause to, to look at the, the parliamentary um, uh, declarations and, you know, saw some, some people had some short-stay accommodation uh, listed as, as uh, part of their um, portfolio of properties. Um, and um, obviously there are flaws and limitations, but I think this is a really good start. Uh, I, I take on board what the CEO is saying about about tightening up um, what uh, Alderman Bloomfield has, has made. We have this uh, before us. It, it presents an opportunity to, to have the transparency that we haven't had as yet uh, and to lead. My question um, to the CEO uh, or whoever can, can help this. So if we uh, adopt this tonight through you, Lord Mayor, uh, is this uh, mandated for for all elected members? CEO? 
Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. And I will invite um, my colleague next to me to clarify if I'm mistaken. But my understanding is that the Local Government Act is the Local Government Act and a policy of council can't override that, which means if you're not required to do what's asked for in this policy, it's up to each individual elected member to do so. Um, therefore, we can't mandate as a council something that provides extra provisions as it relates to the Act itself. Thank you. And um, uh, therein lies, lies a flaw. However, it is something that we, we can set as a standard. I think it's, it's quite useful for us uh, to, to do and uh, I hope that this will be considered as part of uh, local government reforms, uh, that, that there is this transparency for, for elected members across Tasmania. Further discussion, Councillor Dutta? Uh, I just have another question or seeking clarification through you, Chair. Uh, with regards to uh, uh, page 270, attachment A, um, and it's the, uh, e, personal debt over 10,000, um, what is the rationale behind that? Um, is that a personal thing? You know, should we have it there? I need some clarification. So I'll ask um, the manager of corporate governance to respond, but I think the general comment that I will make that's already been answered by Director Reynolds is that this has been based on very similar registers in other in other cities and jurisdictions, so it's it's really been taken from what's general practice elsewhere. However, um, that's an overarching comment. So I'll hand over to manager of corporate governance. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, yeah, look, just to follow up on what the question and the CEO's answer, I think yes, the, the tiny star just above three publication does note that it's all subject to the Local Government Act, which as the CEO said, nothing, and the Lord Mayor mentioned, nothing here can derogate from that. If Council chooses to add additional requirements above and beyond what's in the Local Government Act, then you can do that through the policy. Um, just in relation to Councillor Dutta's your earlier reference to the Public Interest Disclosures Act, um, even though they've got the same public interest term, my understanding is that the Public Interest Disclosures Act is actually about whistleblowing. So that's a separate, a separate matter from, from what's here. Uh, and sorry, I missed your question that you just that's asked. Why have the personal debt over 10,000? Look, I'm honestly not sure of the significance. I guess you need a threshold somewhere because everybody has debts and, uh, you know. Your response is correct. It's been based on better practice in other jurisdictions and we've taken it by way of example and included here in the policy. Yep. Further discussion? <coughs> uh, Councillor Fosselt. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Uh, look, as the person who brought this motion before the Council, um, I just wanted to reiterate to Alderman Bloomfield that her questions are put in good faith and I'm, I'm more than, would more than <coughs> welcome to see this clarified, tightened up, anything that makes it stronger and better uh, is more than welcome to come back to the Chamber if it so needs to. Um, the important thing here is that we're setting the standard as a capital city in lieu of the state government stepping up to the plate and as we should, there's a local government review going on and if we can lead by example and get some things included in that that perhaps the state wouldn't have otherwise done, then that's a good outcome for local government governance around the state, regardless of how those local government electorates look like in the future. So I do encourage everybody to get on board with this one. And I also encourage noting that we cannot mandate or enforce people to disclose their interests. I also strongly encourage everyone around this table to declare your, your interests uh, in the interest of good governance and accountability to the people who elected you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Alderman Bloomfield. Um, look, I just had another question, and that was, um, look, I, I realise this, this is at its infancy, okay? I'm highlighting issues that are significant because I know that they will create trouble later. But in particular too, there's another area that I'd really like some clarification, or at least let's look forwards to see where this will go. But um, I'd like to have some kind of idea of um, if I declare all my interests, and I've got a bit of this and a bit of that, um, who's going to see it? How easy is it for them to see this? Will I find it posted all over the Mercury or somewhere else or through Facebook? I would like to know that there's a modicum of um, security in this data that I'm going to supply in good faith. 
that um, it will be treated with respect and that people who wish to in good faith look at it, which I have no problem with whatsoever, open book here, but I'd like to know that, that it will have some kind of control or something on it to ensure that we are treated with respect despite whatever we have chosen to invest in. Response, who would oh, like to respond? Too. CEO. Uh, thank you, and I understand um, the question, Lord Mayor. It's certainly something that we'd need to just reference in regard to other jurisdictions. So I think the intent is that it becomes part of a public record. So anyone could come and ask to inspect that, um, and therefore it would be available and on the website as well. I think that's the intent based on what happens in other jurisdictions. So again, um, you're not mandated or required to, but it would be a policy that would, the intent, um, should it be adopted by council, would be that you would actually have that material made public um, on a register of sorts. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, question with regard to lobbying the state government or the process for having the Local Government Act amended to include um, such a policy. Have we, have, we, have we spoken about that already and should we be looking at an amendment to the Local Government Act to make this mandatory across the whole state? I'm not sure whether it was in our submission, was it in our submission? Through you, Lord Mayor, I think it was referenced um, in the submission under a collection of things around heightened um, transparency and so on, but I don't think it was specifically raised in the last submission. Um, there is opportunity, of course, to raise that in the next council submission, given that council will consider one prior to the close out of the reform Thanks, agenda. Thanks, um, CEO. Could I move that as an amendment that the council do look at a process for um, including this in its next submission, or include Council the mandatory include. nature of this in its next submission. Okay, so that's an amendment from Councillor Harvey. Have you got a second of your amendment? Yeah, Alderman Burnett. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, she's spoken. Okay. Uh, any discussion on the <laughs> amendment, or would you like to make the case more happy with that? Well, if it's if it's not mandatory because it doesn't it's sub, sub, subsidiary to the Local Government Act, then we can see what's going to happen. Some of us will declare, others won't, because there's no compulsion to do so. Um, and I think this sets a standard for us to be able to self-declare. However, I do think we should work towards an amendment in the Local Government Act to make this more meaningful. So therefore, I urge everyone to support the amendment um, and we see if we can get it put into the Local Government Act at an appropriate time. Any further discussion on the amendment? I'll put that then. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. 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 Show of hands. All those in favour? Councillor Sherlock, Councillor Posselt, Councillor Loberger, Alderman Bloomfield, uh, Alderman Councillor Dutter, Councillor Harvey, Deputy Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor. And against? Alderman Barakas, um, Councillor Elliott, Councillor Kelly. Yeah, through you, Lord Mayor, the um, motion's passed. Eight votes to three. So, um, on to the substantive motion as amended. Uh, any further discussion before I put that? Okay, I'll put that then. All those in favour say aye. 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 Against say no. Show of hands, all those in favour? Barakas, Councillor Sherlock, Councillor Purcell, Councillor Loberger, Alderman Bloomfield, Councillor Dutta, Councillor Harvey, Deputy Lord Mayor. Mayor. Against? Councillor Elliott and Councillor Kelly. I declare the motion three Lord Mayor passed, nine votes to two. Okay, moving on now to item 16, the draft property developer contact register policy. Um, so the policies, are, um, draft policy is attached, moved by Deputy Second Lord Mayor, Mayor, seconded by Councillor Sherlock. Uh, any discussion on this policy? Seeing none. Oh, there is one. Uh, Alderman Barakas. I thought somebody was going to speak. Um, thank, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, look, I. I supported the last item because I do think 
um, good governance is important and transparency is important. I think especially um, uh, if we're talking about having a similar standard to what members of parliament have in this state. Um, and, and broadly, I think, you know, if we want to take ourselves as, and be taken as seriously as other levels of government, I think it's appropriate that we hold ourselves to a similar standard. That, that said, I, that, that doesn't extend to, to this item for reasons that have, I've, I've elaborated on in, in previous iterations of this coming before council. But also, and I think it, it did come out in the last debate um, uh, on, the, on the question of whether or not these policies would be mandatory. The entire intent of this policy is to provide a level of transparency of contact between developers and elected members that might be less than um, above board. And given that this is non, it's not enforceable, the simple nature is that those that are engaging in improper contact between developers and elected members aren't going to disclose those contacts. So the exact behaviour that we're trying to crack down on is the same behaviour that isn't going to get captured by this. It's all the regular communication that is entirely proper that's going to just cause additional bureaucracy for elected members here and for staff and additionally will provide a chilling effect on people thinking that, oh, if I've, got to, I've got to consider whether or not I contact elected members because it's, it's going to all get recorded on a, on a, on a big thing. So I, I, I do have significant concerns about this. I think it does question our ability to um, use our discretion in regards to what's proper conduct and what's not. Um, and furthermore, I think, and as this has been discussed to quite some length, it's completely discriminatory in the fact that it targets one particular group um, on one particular side of an issue. It doesn't, doesn't target groups that uh, are well organised and exist for the purposes of opposing certain developments. It doesn't impact on, it doesn't affect whether or not uh, you know, a property, a commercial property owner of the property next door that might have a, a, a financial gain in making sure that the, the, the block next door doesn't get developed from contacting us and offering all sorts of, all, all sorts of things. And, and I'll say pretty confidently, and I, I can only speak for myself, I can't speak for anyone here. The only time I've ever felt like I've ever felt pressured aggressively or improperly or, 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 any, or any else how has been from people that are against the development getting approved. It's always been oh, if, you, if you vote for, if you vote for that I'll make sure. If you if you do like the the, the that sort of pressure's only ever come from one side of the one side of that table. So to have something that's so one sided, so specifically targeted to one group of people, I think. Is, the definition of discrimin discriminatory. I think it has a chilling effect on people being able to contact us as elected representatives. And ultimately, at the end of the day, it will do nothing to address the problem it's purporting to address. So for, for those reasons, I'd be opposing this and I'd be encouraging everybody else to as well. Further discussion? Uh, I think actually Deputy Lord Mayor was next. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Well, Lord Mayor, I'm... <laughs> I'm somewhat flabbergasted by um, what I've just heard. Uh, this, this is about uh, trying to reduce any sort of um, leading to any sort of corruption as far as I read it. Uh, we want to, to make sure that our dealings with, with uh, property developers, uh, those people involved with, with uh, development applications uh, and um, putting them, them forward, uh, are not. Um, we're making sure that that all of these these transactions are are um, registered rather than not registered uh, and and doing so uh, um, illegally. We live in a fairly small town. Everybody knows everybody else, and um, it's it's really incumbent on this council to be seen to be doing the right thing and actually doing the right thing. So. To, to say that um, this is not um, a sensible move, uh, that it will only catch those people who um, are doing the right things rather than, than, than somebody who's doing the wrong thing, who, who is out setting out to do the wrong thing, uh, is, is really missing the point. 
there there is in Tasmania, and I don't think it, it comes as any any great surprise. But there there is uh, persistent lobbying uh, by uh, developers, and there there are um, impacts on our our governance. So this is just as important as the last motion to ensure that we are providing that opportunity for good governance for ourselves. Uh, I think Alderman Bloomfield was next, then Councillor Dutter. Okay, apologies, I'm going to give some accounting explanation and then I'm going to show you why it's so relevant. Because a few years ago, we actually had um, an ethical um, legislation come through. It's called no class. And with no class for an accountant, it means if someone comes to us and says something that's highly inappropriate and illegal, we actually, by law, must in fact report it to the appropriate authorities. So when someone comes to me and says, I want to do stuff under the table, I can say, I'm sorry, but the fact that you've done that, I now have a snow situation, I have to now declare this because of no class, and I can show them legislation. What that does in my practice, what it does for me, it protects me as an accountant, as a professional. Because the problem that all of us in this room, in fact, do have, is that there will always be that one person who figures that they can just approach and say what they like, do as they please. And somehow, we have to navigate this through. What this particular legislation does, for whatever it may or may not be capable of doing, it is something that you can put between you and that person and say, no, um, I know that you want to do X, Y, Z, but this legislation that I have in front, which I intend to follow, suggests that I need to declare that oh, we had this conversation and you need to be comfortable with that. So I suggest to you that you do not go that direction and talk to somebody else or it's going to go on here. It actually supplies you protection, just as no client allows me to operate a practice knowing that I can actually safely say that I have clients that are law abiding because I point them straight to no client and say this is the consequence of your bad behaviour. I can also do the same with this, with this legislation here. I actually think it's quite vital and it's a way of allowing Hobart to grow up into um, the same status as we have in other, other states because there are instances, and in fact it was interesting, when I actually put it up on my Facebook page you mentioned about this whole concept, people were going, but there are already instances, people have already tried this stuff here. So I do think we have a genuine reason. It might not be particularly common, but my goodness, we need to show and lead the way and be better. Here. Further discussion? Any further discussion? Oh, yeah, Councillor Jasso. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just have a question um, with regards to the uh, the term used, page 275, number 4A. Uh, a developer means an individual body corporate or company engaged in a business that regularly involves. Now, there is no definition of regularly. Is it six times? Is it four times? Is it twice? Um, you know, I, I, uh, so if the same developer, for example, comes to me and I have uh, made this contact, it just, for me, it, it, it does not give that clarity. Uh, CEO, would you like to respond? Um, so I think the CEO is suggesting she'll take it on notice. Oh, thank you. All right. Thank, thank you very much. Now, I, I think, uh, you know, for me, it's very clear what uh, Alderman Baraka said. I take his points. I think he has made some good points, and I don't take that away. However, uh, we, we are trying to simply bring about a policy, a, a standard for ourselves. That's what we're doing. Uh, this is not a legislation, as we have said, and it's not mandatory. So we don't have to uh, go along with it. But if we do have a policy that gives us a standard as it were, then uh, as elected members, you know, we want to fulfill those things uh, to make sure that we are open and transparent in our dealings. And if we're not doing the wrong thing, you know, I, I personally have no problems with that. Uh, but if I am doing the wrong things, then I want to hide that. Um, so for me, I need a clarification as to regularly because it, it, it really clarifies it for me that we are not talking about, uh, you know, developer A uh, who's developing the property. 
uh, once in 10 years. You know, we're not referring to people like that. We will continue to make those contacts. But if a developer who puts in application regularly, um, six times a year, as it were, then that is a different matter. And I think that's what this is uh, referring to. Thank you. Okay, further discussion? Uh, I think Councillor Kelly was next. I'm sorry, I'm oh. sorry, what you had me doing was just trying to communicate with uh, Director, Director Reynolds. Reynolds. Just to clarify, through, thank you. Through you, Lord Mayor. Uh, for the sake of clarity, we didn't. We haven't defined regularly, but if it's to avoid any confusion about trying to quantify what regularly may mean, we could actually delete the term from that part of the policy and just say involves the making of relevance, so it, it wouldn't actually be based on any frequency. Um, okay. We just so, would you like to m move that as an amendment? Yeah. Move regularly, because I think the point is, I guess, no, that this is <laughs> this is a business that yeah. that is in the business of property development. So, it's an individual body, corporate company engaged in a business that involves the you know making of planning applications, etc. Councillor Posselt. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, again, as the member of the original motion, uh, I thought I'd just speak to this uh, item, um, <clears throat> that perhaps uh, amending it to include a definition of regular would be the most helpful way to go about it, if uh, council members are amenable to that. Um, I'm not sure if there's a problem with uh, within the, around the table about the actual frequency as opposed to just defining it better. Um, if I've misread that, then that's that's fine. But I would propose that just having a, an amendment to include a, de a definition of regular, um, which we can take offline for discussion or have a suggestion put to us and and go from there, uh, would be the way I'd propose addressing this issue. Just a, just a clarification on that. It might be that regular, you get five phone calls or whatever, and I don't get any because they don't want to talk to me. <laughs> not, that's not the regular. It's, no, it's, it's how regularly they're developing, whether or not whether or not they're a developer or just a, an everyday person. Not how, how often they contact you. No, no. No. It's to do with how they develop. They develop. It's the regularity of them developing. Yeah. You don't know how regular it might become, but anyway, then you'll put it in then. Okay. All right. Look, if, if there needs to be an amendment and a definition included, you might need, it might need, to, sorry, to be deferred again, because we can't um, approve it without, and say we want a definition. Uh, my, my perspective on the matter would be that we could potentially do that, Lord Mayor, in that if, if the council comes to the conclusion that the definition, the, the actual definition doesn't matter, it's just the, the principle of having a definition that matters, which I, I think is Councillor Dutta's point, which is that there is no regular, could be two points a year or two points every decade, uh, and there just needs to be clarity so that we can follow the policy as to when we need to report and when we don't need to report, as opposed to the actual definition of regular, would be my interpretation. Um, okay, I'm just seeking guidance from the floor here. We've either, we either proceed as is, or somebody moves an amendment oh, on the issue of amendment. Yes. We drop the word regular. Regularly. regularly. Yep. Okay, seconded by who? Any seconded for that? Uh, Alderman Bloomfield. Uh, so that will just take out that tricky word and um, leaves it at the, that it's a business that's engaged in the process of making like planning applications. Alderman Barakas. Lord Mayor, just speaking, yes, speaking to the amendment, yes, I've spoken to the substantive. Um, not, look, not, not to try and approve a motion that I'm entirely, a policy that I'm entirely against, but I think this is an important distinction here, and I think it was one that bore out in debate in previous iterations of this, where the, the, the term of a developer was aimed at targeting those that were, in, were, were developing as a, as a major regular part of their, their income stream, not somebody, not a, not a you know, nurse, tradie, everyday person, you or me, that might, you know, be putting in a set, putting in an ancillary dwelling at the back of a house or, or you know, or building a unit on a property just as a one-off. And my worry is removing the word regularly in that definition effectively opens that policy up to any applicant that would be putting forward any kind of development whatsoever. And I think, I actually think the definition of, of regularly is specific to target those that are regularly focused on the business of developing, they're property developers, they're not somebody that's had a little bit of 
um, surplus cash, like, oh, we'll put a nest egg away, we'll buy, buy, we'll buy another, build another house. Um, we're talking about those that are in the business of developing property all the time and the, the regular, the use, the use of the word regular defines that and I think removing it fundamentally changes the intent of that whole definition. I think it's actually really, really important because it'll open it up to everybody um, if, if, if that word's removed. Uh, Councillor Postel, she's speaking to the amendment. Thank you. Yes, just a question to the relevant director. Um, is the uh, definition of a property developer based on a definition used elsewhere, or verbatim for that matter? I, I have to confirm that, but I believe it is. Okay, any further discussions on the amendments? Councillor Kelly? Oh, not on the amendment, no. It's on the amendment, no. I'm just going to... Uh, comments on the amendment? Yes. Um, all right. Um, I think Ryan has it correctly. The fact is that we've already got a definition there of developer. Um, a developer is a developer is a developer. Um, um, we have definitions, they're in tax law. So um, I, I think that it's probably easier to worry more about that than it is to worry about the word regular, um, simply because um, we don't want to be monitoring someone's business um, acumen or speed we simply want to know that um, if I trace their business and find that they are in the business of building property and developing stuff, clearly that's someone who should be on my list. Okay, so we have um, the amendment to remove the word regularly from this clause, moved by Councillor Harvey. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against say no. Show of hands, all those in favour? Alderman Bloomfield, Alderman Harvey, Deputy Lord Mayor. Against? Barakas, Councillor Sherlock, Councillor Elliott, Councillor Purcell, Oberger, Councillor Kelly, Councillor Dutta, and the Lord Mayor. Okay, any further discussion on the substantive motion? Councillor Kelly. Um, look, I think the intent of this is fine with me. I don't really have any dramas with it. I think it's highlighted that what just this brief discussion on some small part of it just highlights that we're just fraught with difficulty in getting definition on this. And I think we can be look, start looking like a bunch of clowns if we're going to go down this road. Uh, we can be looked, I withdraw that statement. Uh, we can look uh, rather silly. Point of order. I don't think we look like clowns or silly okay. by having proper debate. Um, Councillor Kelly, um, I... So what's, your, what's the point of order? We're not silly by, because we've discussed this. We're not clowns either. I didn't say we were silly. I'm, I'm I said offended. we could look silly. Okay. Um, I'm, I don't think it's quite a point of order because it's not offensive. I know it's um, probably a bit un unnecessary, um, Councillor Kelly, but I wouldn't say that it's highly offensive. But, um, but maybe you can take note of your colleagues' concerns, Councillor Kelly. I take uh, uh, Alderman... Um, Councillor Harvey. Uh, Councillor um, Barakas' uh, comments about possibility of being discriminatory. Um, it just lacks clarification. I asked at the last one of the meetings previously if there had been any cases of this causing any issues and the director said not to his knowledge at all. There are checks and balances we already have in place. And to me too, uh, this is a condition of employment that, that should be put on the table at the start of a commencement or prior to an election of people wanting to stand for council, not three months into a four year term. And I think that's grossly unfair. Might not affect a lot of people here. I speak to developers a lot. Uh, I would find this embarrassing. Uh, I know they would probably balk at even speaking to me in some instances if they know their name's going to be continually referenced and, and all that. I say, no problem with the intent. It's once again, as I said earlier tonight, it's the due process that's not being followed properly here, I don't think. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Elliott. Um, well, that was very entertaining, hearing people complain about someone being, well, not even being called a clown in points of order. No one jumped up a couple of months ago, which was rather disappointing. Really disappointing. What, from point of order, time. Lord Mayor, just on relevance. Oh, just on relevance. Myself. Just on relevance. Comments are unrelated to the topic of discussion. Uh, I think 
Um, it was related to, a bit to the discussion. It was, it was a, a personal opinion of Councillor Elliott's um, to relate it to another discussion where that terminology was used. So I think it's vaguely relevant. But and anyway, I, I got to say it, so it's said. Um, so when it comes to this topic, I have a question, please. I, if we're going to have this policy apply, I'd like to also voluntarily submit the communication that I get from the anti-people, the people against the applications, because I agree with Alderman Barakas that that's where, by far, in only five, six months on council, that's where, by far, the amount of heavy pressure comes from. It comes from people against things. So my question is to the, um, to, through, to the CEO, relevant director, through you, Chair, is if I voluntarily provide the council officers with the contact from anti-people, people against ap applications, can that also be captured and recorded? CEO? Um, through you, look, I'm answering this sort of off the top of my head. It, it's certainly not relevant in the context of this policy. I understand that. Um, so it's something we'd need to explore further. Um, again, we're sort of, we have the privacy legislation as well, um, so we just need to be careful. So we'd need to take that on notice and provide a more comprehensive response. Sorry, Councillor Elliott. No, that's fine. Thank you. And just on the topic of privacy, how does this fit in with capturing developer information? What will be publicly available? Will we have names, phone numbers, addresses, things like that published? Uh, through you, Lord Mayor, and I will stand corrected by my colleagues, but my understanding is that it would just be the name. It wouldn't actually include any other details. So it would be a register of the developer, um, their name and business entity without other contact details. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I concur also with um, Councillor Kelly around changing the goalposts on um, significantly at the start of a term. And I was really pleased to read in the report around the review of local government that there'll be fresh, fresh elections coming up soon and new councils formed. So even sooner than our four year term, it's highly likely that we'll have to, if we want to stand again, we'll have to campaign and um, try for election again. So with that coming closer, for me, it would have made much more sense to introduce policies um, dramatic changes at that point in time. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Dutta. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the last time I asked a question, and this time I want to speak to some of the points raised. For me, this policy is very clear. It states that it's property developer contact register. Now, uh, I, I think if we look at the explanation given and all the background information in the policy itself, it uh, is simply referring to property developer. Now, for me, that is very clear. Point number two is that I brought up the uh, terminology and the definition of regular. Now, again, if we don't have a definition, it doesn't matter. Each one of us would have to make the judgment and define it the way we can. It may be subjective because it's not quantified. And therefore, we individually take a definition of that word and say, now I've seen this guy too many times, I'm going to re uh, report or else I won't. That's entirely up to us. And the third point that I want to respond to is that uh, this is rather a bit unfair, changing the goalpost. Now, as uh, we know from experience, when we get elected, we come to council and we bring in motions because we campaign for those things during the campaign. And this happens all the time. It doesn't mean that uh, when we come to council, it wasn't there, therefore we shouldn't bring it. And so my understanding of this, when this was brought by Councillor Passant, it was something that he talked about, he campaigned about, and this is his passion, as it were. And he wants to bring about a standard that is relevant and applicable uh, to all the other states and other uh, levels of government. So therefore, I think uh, we come here knowing that there are points that were different, but once we get here and changes come, we've got to simply submit to those things under the policy. And if you don't want to, then that's your prerogative. Thank you. Any further discussion? Uh, I'll put that. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against no. say no. Aye. Show of hands. All those in favour? Councillor Sherlock, Councillor Elliott, Councillor Bassell. Councillor Loberger, Alderman Bloomfield, 
Councillor Dutta, Councillor Harvey, Deputy Lord Mayor and the Lord Mayor. And against? Lord Member Barakas and Councillor Kelly. The motion's carried. Lord Mayor, nine votes to two. Okay, moving on now to the uh, item 17, elected member professional development process. So there's a recommendation moved by Deputy Lord Mayor, seconded by Councillor Sherlock. Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I think this is this is a good move. <laughs> it saves um, having to, to for either you or me um, doing this. So I'm, I'm pleased that uh, uh, Mr. Reynolds is is um, going to take up the cudgel or or to um, make a decision uh, in relation to to uh, what's relevant and what's not. Um, uh, presumably, this. The applications will be the same, um, but uh, I just just have a question in relation to the specifics about the Australian Institute of Company Directors as, as being uh, a course that we um, are encouraged to to undertake. Um, through you to the to the CEO, uh, CEO, if we've already done that course and there are elements you know, other elements which might either s slot in or might be a refresher. How um, is that? Is that recommended as part of uh, what we should be doing or specifics that we, we should be looking at? Um, through you, Lord Mayor, um, Deputy. So that would be the intent. Um, so the recommendation here is that um, the Institute of Australian um, Directors course is certainly one that is well regarded and some jurisdictions have looked at it as being something that's kind of compulsory under the Local Government Act. Um, it's certainly something that's come up in terms of professional development for elected members during the course of the local government reform process and in fact was recently discussed at uh, one of the Legat meetings. So it's recommended that elected members have the opportunity to do it, um, but also if you have already completed it then you would be able to essentially use um, the additional refreshers, as you've outlined, yep. um, as well as part of that contribution for the, the annual training and development program. Uh, Councillor Loberger. Thank you, Chair. Um, I agree with most of what's written here, except I really don't agree at all with the move to double our professional development allowance to $10,000. Um, I don't believe it's a minor amendment, doubling that allowance, as stated, and I, I can't actually support that. Um, however, I do think we can deal with a problem like this. Um, but seeks to this, this raise seeks to solve a problem, and I think we can deal with it in a much cheaper and more acceptable fashion. Um, can I just ask a question first through through you? Or you although you probably are, know the answer, Chair, can can members currently save up their allowance over consecutive years? Uh, I don't know. I think there was that expectation. In fact, I thought we always had a a term allocation rather than that a is, year. yeah. It is term allocation, not yearly. It says yearly in the policy. It says, yeah. it says per annum. Sorry. Um, no, that's my, uh, Director Reynolds. It's a per annum allocation. Originally 5,000, you suggested it's 10, but it's a per annum. No, it doesn't accumulate over the term. It doesn't. So you can't, if you don't use it one year, you can't that's do right. something but more because expensive. Because it's an annual budget allocation, we would make it. Okay. I just think, we, can we amend section C to say we can save it up and, and then we don't have to double it? Um, and also, I, I do. So I'm going to propose an amendment where we strike out the move to double the $5,000 annual limit, or to double it um, from part C, and instead we insert a new section that allows elected members uh, in their first year, well, I think we're going to have to do it in any year because of what we've just heard. So insert a new section into Part C that allows elected members to bring forward their next year's $5,000 allocation, uh, only if the training they've identified in their first in that year costs more than the annual $5,000 allowance. I just think that would save a lot of money. Okay, so this is, so your two amendments are to retain the $5,000 per annum, yep. and secondly to allow allow um, members to bring forward their next year's allowance if their training that they have identified costs more than 5000 And Sorry, what was it? Accrue? Or accrue no, yeah, bring or forward. Accrue and trend. No, not, not, not accrue. Oh. Not accrue. Different. Yeah, just to bring forward their next year's $5,000 to add to this year's 
to pay for their training this year, and then of course they'll forego that, that amount for next year. Yeah, I'm sure that can be better crafted. I don't know if you captured that <laughs> through you. Uh, but I think you have got the general idea of the amendment. Sure, um, so I'm going to move that. Okay, I need a second before that amendment. Councillor uh, Alderman Barakas. Uh, discussions on the amendment? Uh, I have a question for you, Lord Mayor, uh, to the relevant director. Um, why has the um, allowance increased from five to ten thousand dollars? How has that been calculated? And when was the last time uh, that we had an increase uh, to reflect the, uh, the increase in cost to deliver this sort of education? Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm happy to take that question because it was actually me that made this um, recommendation. And I did that on the basis of actually um, going through some of the discussions that had been had with individual elected members at the beginning of the term. Um, also recognising the cost of training and development has gone up significantly um, across the board. And also the fact that the policy and the amount allocated had not been reviewed for some many years. Um, in fact, I would have thought probably up to 10 years. Um, so I think that's something that we need to um, be clear about um, insofar as the, the price has gone up. Um, Lord Mayor, just to be clear also, um, we did do a very quick benchmarking exercise. Um, this would put us, you know, at the top um, range in terms of professional development for elected members. Um, but given we're in a reform period, um, I think it's critically important that from an officer perspective that we're recommending and providing you with the best support possible um, to discharge your role as elected members. And just in recognition, as I said, of the increase in costs um, to you know, good professional development, um, it was considered appropriate. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Barakas. Um, thank, thank you, Lord Mayor. I was planning on getting up and saying something very similar um, on, on this. I think all, all the other changes I'm, I'm very comfortable with, doubling the um, entitlement for our professional development, I think look, professional development is an important part of our role. It's something I've probably been um, a bit lax in. Um, however, we, we you know, likely going into a period where we'll have tight budgets, we'll, we'll be having conversations about you know, what is an appropriate rate increase, what's appropriate free, fee structures for things like the sale and markets, as we heard from storeholders, and it won't just be limited to that, it's going to be a whole range of, of things as cost of living go, is going up and the cost of council to do business goes up and costs are going up everywhere. Um, I, I don't, I think it would be hard to justify it to the public to, to pass the pub test for us to double our professional development entitlement. I think. Take the, take the point that said development's getting more expensive, um, and I think what Councillor Loberg has proposed is a good solution to that, or potentially a good solution to that. Um, um, and as the CEO said, look, as costs go up, we, might, we, will, we will have to um, uh, assess that. I just think in the, in the, in the period that we're going into, um, I, I, just, I just don't know if I'd be able to justify it to somebody on the street while, while we've doubled our professional development entitlement while everybody's costs are going up. So I, I, I'd just be, I just couldn't be comfortable doing that. I think um, what Councillor Loberg has proposed is a good stopgap to, to, to address that issue of some of those courses being more expensive than what the, the, the annual allowance is. Um, I just think we need to, when we're asking, when we're expecting members of the public to be more disciplined with their spending, I think we need to do the same as well. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, look, I uh, can support one element of Councillor Lowberger's amendment, um, and I would like to see us potentially vote on these two items separately. Um, the bringing forward as opposed to accrual or limitations of an annual um, amount is, I think, pretty good practice if there's some you know, major conference in Copenhagen and it's going to cost 15 grand to go. Um, I think that's, that's wise. Um, I think that the importance of professional development can't be understated and that's probably coming from a healthcare background. I know that state uh, doctors uh, have about a $15,000 um, CPD allowance uh, applied to them through their salaries um, and I think that in the context of uh, no prior requisite in training to take this role uh, as compared to a consultant doctor who has 15 years of training to take their role 
that the uh, scope and importance of professional development in the context that we are just community members really can't be understated. Um, if indeed the policy has not been reviewed for the last decade, uh, I, you know, at, with inflation, um, I would suggest that it's probably ballpark what it was 10 years ago if we move it up to $10,000. Uh, it's up to every elected member if they take up the, the full 10000 uh, However, again, I would point out that there is an oath that we took at the start, uh, an oath of office that we took at the start of this term, and professional development is explicitly listed in that. And if we cap the budget at too low a amount, we may in fact not be able to uh, meet our obligations under the oath that we took. So I unfortunately can't support the, the dollar change. Uh, Councillor Dutta. I just have uh, two questions. Uh, question number one. Uh, this uh, 9,289 uh, with, with a discount, uh, 8,449, uh, <coughs> does that uh, include all the elected members or per member for that uh, training? Yeah, the company yeah. directors. Uh, through you, Lord Mayor, um, to Councillor Dutta. So that's per elected member. Um, but let's be clear, that assumes that all elected members actually want to do the AICD course. For those of you who have done it, it's quite an onerous undertaking, albeit a terrific opportunity. It's unlikely that all elected members would seek to do that. So we just need to think about it within that context as well. But it is per elected member. Thank you. And the uh, second question is, um, once we have a budget allocation, um, whichever way we go tonight, um, if we have surpassed that particular allocation for ourselves, uh, is there in the system that we can still apply and the judgment will be made by the CEO or whoever to allow us to do more if we have spent more than 10000 uh, through you, Lord Mayor. Look, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think the intent here is that we, um, as officers, have recommended an amount um, based on, you know, what we consider to be best practice. Um, it would be, I think, unreasonable to expect that elected members would then be given additional um, training and support that would go above and beyond um, the, the allocation recommended. Um, however, as um, has been discussed this evening, there's other ways that you can deal with that in terms of carry forward, um, which is not the right language, but it's using that um, allocation again in another year. Um, so I think that's something to certainly explore as has been raised. Thank you. Uh, just a follow-up clarification. I, I am still not very clear in my mind. My, my question is this. Say, for example, if I take this uh, $8,450 in round figures, uh, and I've only got 150 left, as it were. Now, I have a conference somewhere which I think is homeless and housing uh, that I should go to. Uh, is it not then possible to take that as well because it's relevant or this will disqualify me? Uh, my you can answer. But uh, my understanding is that the council can decide that something is important for an elected and member to go and make a speech at or attend which is separate to this. So that's not that's your right. professional that's right. yeah. development. That's, that's right. Thank what's you. That's what I was saying, that they're separate. Thank you. So if you felt there was something My really apologies. important for your portfolio, yeah. Um, yeah. request that it comes up and the council makes a decision about that separate funding Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. Lord Mayor, just a uh, point of clarification. I made an error in my uh, my remarks. Uh, the consultant doctor allowance is actually $25,000 per annum. Okay, so we've got um, the amendment here, which is to... Re oh, Alderman Bloomfield. <laughs> um, I actually already spent $10,000 a year anyway on my education, and um, I can tell you that the AICD course has absolutely gone through the roof over the last five or six years, and I believe that that $5,000 was based on affording it in the first place, which is probably why this is looking at being increased. So that really brings me to why I'm standing up to speak. And that is that we're in this situation because I think over many years, people have kind of not quite understood the value of training. And this $5,000 probably just felt arbitrary until it became relevant. And ultimately, if this $5,000 over the last five or 10 years had in fact been adjusted for CPI, we wouldn't be having this conversation. 
So I would say, looking forwards, perhaps the amendment should actually have an adjustment for CPI within it, so that we actually have um, value um, um, assigned to us for education. Because the education of $5,000 worth of education 10 years ago was obviously far superior than what $5,000 will purchase is for us now. Now, I appreciate we need to um, lessen what we can actually attain now. That's fine and absolutely acceptable in these circumstances. But I do think that we need to be a little bit more mature and look at um, assigning a CPI adjustment per annum on these um, allowances so that we don't end up far short of what we require to do basic education. Uh, so, Alderman Bloomfield, you could ask Councillor Loberger to include that. I'm happy to include amendment. that as long as the secondaries. Yep. Uh, yep. Councillor Elliott. Uh, yes, I support um, Alderman Bloomfield's suggestion. I think that makes a lot of sense. I also support uh, Alderman Barakas's, um, the principle no, principle around um, making sure that, you know, we're not in times of uh, flourish, you know, it's more of a time of famine really, so we need to make sure that the amounts that we have are very reasonable and justifiable. Um, from a flexibility point of view, it would make sense from, from my perspective, given we are usually can, um, signed on for four year terms, to have a figure that was available to us over the term. So instead of having to accrue, from my perspective, it would be, you know, we have $20,000 available to us for the life of our term. So that's, you know, even if I'd be happy to reduce that, you know, like 15, but we have $5,000 a, a year at the moment. Um, I think providing us with $20,000 over the life of our term, and that's the end of the story. Then we have the flexibility to do AICD in year one, and it is an onerous um, undertaking, as the CEO said. So, um, I think these are what, improvements to the policy, but I just wanted to put that um, life expenditure concept out there because that makes most sense to me. I mean, that's, you, that could be added as something that's a total of $20,000 can be spent in one term. Um, just given that we're, it's a great suggestion, I really like it, but given that we're likely to have quite a, a short, possibly going to have a foreshortened term here, I'm a bit uncomfortable with it because we may well. A regular term. Yeah, a regular term. Uh, yeah, well, in that case, I mean, if we and if the I term don't ends, I don't think what, what do we do if the term ends halfway yeah. through? Yeah. Oh, All right. I don't think we can predict months. any of that. So let's just make the policy on the basis of which we're elected. Commit to not going on spending sprees. <laughs> yes. Right, yes. next year. Party. So um, we'll move that. That does a, an amendment. I think Councillor Lowberg happy to is happy that to in. include that in. Are yeah, you I'm or not? Happy no, you're not. <laughs> no, it's, it, All feels, right. it feels like a rise. It, like it feels like we're increasing the number yeah. again. I'm going to have to take that as a separate amendment, yeah. but I'd like to just deal with the first amendment before we play with other amendments. Okay, so um, if there's no further discussion on Councillor Loberger's amendment, I'm just going to remind everyone that it's um, that it asks the um, professional development activities be these are the elected elective. Professional development activities allowance is $5,000 per annum, adjusted each year for CPI. Um, and then the addition of elected members can bring forward next year's allocation to pay for an opportunity that costs more than $5,000 in one year. And that's it. OK, all those in favour of that amendment say aye. 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 Say no. Aye. Show of hands, all those in favour. Alderman Barakas, Councillor Sherlock, Councillor Loberger, Bloomfield, Councillor Kelly, Councillor Dutter, Deputy Lord Mayor and Lord Mayor. Okay, and then we've got an additional um, clarification amendment. Is that what you wanted? Oh, oh, sorry. Against. Sorry, against. Sorry. Councillor Elliott, Councillor Perselt, Councillor Harvey, um, Lord Mayor, that's carried three votes, sorry, eight votes to three, for the amendment. Okay. Um, Councillor Elliott, did you want to add your additional amendment or not worry about it? No, not worry. All right, well, it's so work. I'm now going to see if there's any further discussion on this item, otherwise I'll put the motion as amended. Uh, yeah, Lord Mayor, I think um, if we, well, I could ask the question, but I think I know the answer um, of the allocated through you to Mr Reynolds, <laughs> um, 
of the allocated uh, professional development funds, do we ever spend 100% of that? Uh, Lord Mayor, I think um, professional development, as has been um, raised here, is is a, a really important component of our work. Uh, I, um, you know, like we have, haven't, uh, for those who, who are having subsequent terms, we have not necessarily done professional development, uh, travelled to interstate conferences or, or even within Tasmania necessarily. Uh, because of COVID. So uh, there's a bit of catching up to, to do, not only for for new new members, uh, new elected members, but also people who, who haven't had that opportunity because, or haven't taken that opportunity. I think we do need to, to really change um, the culture. And I think the, I commend the CEO for, for wanting to do that. It's, it's a really important thing for us to be across planning. Uh, I intend to to um, go to a planning conference next next month uh, in Adelaide and I, I uh, suggest that I'm probably sending it to all the member archers, but do, and I know that it's been in the CEO's newsletter, but it's, uh, those are invaluable to, to gain a lot of skills uh, in relation to planning and to hear what, is, what has been occurring in other jurisdictions. So. I really uh, feel uh, that that we shouldn't undervalue uh, these opportunities, um, and really uh, feel that we we should accept this policy uh, as it is. Um, I'm, I feel feel that it's it's something that will uh, be of benefit not only to individual elected members but to the communities we serve. Okay. If there's no further discussion, I'll put the motion as amended. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against say no. Car was that? Oh, all those in favour? Alderman Barakas, Councillor Sherlock, Councillor Loberger, Alderman Bloomfield, Councillor Kelly, Councillor Dutta, Councillor Harvey, Deputy Lord Mayor and the Lord Mayor. Uh, sorry. Yep. And Councillor Purcell, my apologies. Oh, no, that was against, sorry. <laughs> no. Against. No, sorry, all those against, sorry. Councillor Purcell. Um, I'll take Councillor Elliot. Um, just do the vote again for four. Oh, no, just, just leave me as absent. Okay, thank you. Um, hey, um, we don't have absent, we've got... Um, oh, we do have those. It should probably be called again. All right. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Again, say no. Sorry. Uh, all those in favour, show of hands, please. Alderman Barakas, Councillor Sherlock, Councillor Elliott, Councillor Lowberger, Alderman Bloomfield, Councillor Kelly, Councillor Dada, Councillor Harvey, the Deputy Lord Mayor and Lord Mayor. Against. Carried Lord Mayor, 10 votes to one. Now, we've just got two more items on the open portion of our meeting. Both of them are... Um, <coughs> Oh, no, we've got some motions. Can I request that we perhaps do 18 and 19 and then break for um, dinner before we come back for motions? Is, is everyone happy with that? Yeah. Okay, so we've got uh, item 18 is the first submission recommended for um, s endorsing. Moved by Deputy Lord Mayor, seconded by Councillor Harvey. Um, any discussion? Yes. Uh, I'll keep it very brief, Lord Mayor, but the comments uh, relating to uh, both this item and the next item are a, uh, consistent with the comments that I made at the previous um, council meeting about the quality of our submissions. I believe that we want to be submitting um, any submission to any other level of government uh, should be of a quality that it places it at the top of the pile, not of the, at the bottom, uh, and I would like to see uh, moving forward higher quality submissions. Um, was there something in particular you thought could be added, or was it just oh, a general? Too, too hard. Okay, I think that'll be noted by the relevant director. Um, okay, all those in favour of this submission say aye. aye. Against say no. Carried unanimously. And then the second submission. Second Lord Mayor. Moved by Deputy Lord Mayor, seconded by um, Councillor Sherlock. This is the submission to the Tasmanian Climate Change 
Action Plan 23 to 25. Uh, any discussion on that motion? Oh, sorry, on that submission. There being none, I'll put that. All those in favour say aye. aye. Can say no. Carried unanimously. Uh, now I'd like to move uh, that we uh, adjourn the meeting. Sorry. Move Deputy Lord Mayor, seconded by Councillor Dada. All those in favour aye. say aye. aye. Again, say no. So adjourn the meeting till, um, say, 25 past. Is that all right? Oh, it's
Third, and uh, we will move now to item 20, uh, which is uh, yeah, parking meters in North Hobart yeah. motion. You might have so, to wait for the move of the motion to come in. Alderman, oh, I see. Councilor Kelly. Um, um, so, Kelly, I'm just about to open the item 20, um, parking meters in North Hobart, um, and invite you to to move your shared motion, the motion from Alderman Zuko and yourself. I'd like to move the motion relating to the uh, North Hobart parking, which is outlined, and I won't read out in full, in tonight's agenda. Second by Alderman Barakas. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, I'd just like to open and say, look, I think we all here know pretty much the story of what's happened up there in North Hobart. Um, the installation of the metres happened back in uh, early 1920, uh, 2021, and um, unfortunately it's been a pretty sad story. Uh, it's time to move on from that now, and what basically the traders are wanting is just some action. And um, unfortunately, um, the installation did go through. It ignored all the principles of Council's uh, you know, manifesto on consultation. Uh, it had immediate impact on the... Uh, on the, uh, the, the the trading of the strip, uh, and if that wasn't bad enough, it was introduced at probably the worst possible time anyone could do anything. It was right in the middle of COVID, so the pure judgment on uh, doing it and the timing was just uh, just so bad. Um, 19 months have passed, and today still, the sadly the uh, those blue tombstones, the eight of them stand there, and it's it's a psychological barrier for people who even wanting to go and stop in North Hobart. You see them. Um, and, uh, look, I, I'm just not going to stop for two minutes to go to the news agency, chemists, pick up food. I'll go to the next suburb. So it had a, an incredible bad impact on trading. It's been well documented, all that as well. So they, the, the, the existence of them there still is bad. I mean, you can get out, you go, you park your car, it might be five or six spaces away from them. You look at the, uh, the number to put input into your phone, which many people do this day and age, and all you get up is a meeting, oh, there's no parking available. There's no even message to the people to be able to say that, look, this is not, uh, they're not in operation at the moment. You don't have to pay, they're just sort of hooded. So that is another sort of uh, nail in the coffin as why the whole, the, the metre thing has um, been such a, 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 a bad thing. Um, the parking the times there too is another part of the motion. Um, you can be up in North Hobart Sunday night in the middle of winter, rain, hail and snow, and be booked at 8.30pm. Um, it's Where's the justice in this when in CBD it's 6pm? Um, other parts of Salamanca might be that, but there is just, it's just irrational how the, 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 the parking overlay with the times and the zones, it's, it's just wrong. It's, it's discriminatory against North Hobart. There are no other satellite uh, suburb areas that even have it like that. So that's another part of the motion which um, uh, we've brought up that can be fixed very, very easily. Um, the digital parking signage, uh, it's been talked about for years, once again, no action. Um, and the response from uh, council officers mentioned a lot of other issues like, you know, Swan Street Park and uh, a few other things that haven't. Look, really, that's got absolutely nothing to do with um, the parking metres and the time zones as well. So, look, in summary, there's absolutely no reason why uh, this, the, the, the eight metres cannot be pulled out of the ground, capped underneath. Uh, there's up to 60 days to do that. It's been talked about. There's been no reason given why, logically, this can't happen. So it, what we're asking, or what the traders are asking, and bear in mind it's not from the aldermen this are coming from, or councillors, it's coming from the hearts of the traders. And it's been embarrassing going back as an old councillor and even being on the, as, uh, on the association, continually going back to traders who are just so busy, grumpy, doing what they do and just saying, well, we just don't know when this is going to happen. There's no real rationale. You put it in the background of all this, the Leftway Street car park debacle, four years, of a barren bit of dirt just sitting there. I think council's paid up to $200,000 for the rent on that. Uh, it got forgotten about four years later. Now, uh, and it's taken work, which has started now and, and will be completed very soon. However, that's just been another nail in the coffin and people in North Hobart have just given up. It's embarrassing to be part of the whole 
thing when I go back and tell them, you know, stuff's happening and all that sort of stuff, nothing has happened. There's absolutely no reason why the parking metres and all the other, the other two items we've listed on there cannot happen within the time frames. Thank you. Further discussion? Um, uh, Councillor Sherlock. Yeah, thank you, Lord Mayor. Just going on what um, Councillor Kelly has noted, just we don't know what's happening or when what's going to happen. Can you just give us a ballpark through you to the CEO or the relevant director? Can you give us a ballpark on when the time frame of when the Hobart North Hobart precinct plan is going to be coming back to us? Or? Uh, CEO. Um, thank you. Through you, Lord Mayor. Look, there's no doubt there was a delay in getting the North Hobart work underway in terms of the structure plan. Um, we've actually been out in market for the consultants to work on that structure plan now, and in fact, we're going through the process of evaluating submissions. Um, so it's at least sort of six months away from a draft being developed. Um, so that's the time frame that's been amended from the original report. It has been delayed. Thank you. And, and sorry, just one more question. Why, why was there a delay? Um, through you, Lord Mayor, I think at the time we were dealing with the more immediate issues associated with hooding the metres, um, looking at other improvements along the North Hobart Strip, um, and also dealing with the issue that was raised about the undeveloped car park that had been committed to, including another one that we are still currently working through. Um, so those things were really prioritised, um, but there was also just a workload issue and availability of staff to get moving on the structure plan. So we're at a point now where we're resourced up to be able to do that more um, in a timely fashion. Thank you very much. So there were reasons behind the delay, and I, I fully understand, um, you know, those those issues from council officers' perspective, and also concerns from uh, business and the community. Um, during my time, I've also collected information from businesses and community, and there's no doubt um, the parking meters do not need to be in North Hobart. Uh, I, and I fully and strongly support the, the removal of the parking metres in North Hobart. Um, and, but really for me, um, I would like more qualified advice <coughs> and evidence to support my decision. I, I don't want to be governing on the fly. Uh, I know that there's currently work being done uh, and I fully understand your concerns and what's been raised in the motion. Um, and as has already been stated, it will become available to us shortly. There were delays and there, there were reasons behind the delays. And this happens in bureaucracy. It happens anywhere, it's part of life. Um, so this for me then becomes an issue of fairness uh, for me and treating all precincts equally in terms of process and, and really not undermining the work of our staff that they're already doing on this issue. Uh, proper process, procedure and policy development based on evidence is, is crucial to good governance. And I know we all talked about that around the table here today. Many of us said, uh, um, around the table said, good governance is important, due process is important. Well, we can't just pick and choose when due process applies, because it applies on this instance as well. Um, as such, I think it's probably fair then to put a procedural motion to defer this matter to the relevant workshop or um, conversations that are happening that are dealing with the North Hobart precinct plan in a more holistic and proper manner. So, uh, because if you value equal treatment and the principle of proper process, uh, I hope you will support the defer deferral motion. Thank you. Okay, that's a deferral motion, which means there'd be no further discussion, but um, perhaps if uh, Councillor Sherlock is happy to allow a bit more debate before the yeah, council sure. decides whether to defer it, um, just so that people feel they can have their, their, say. their say about whether deferral is... Yeah. Uh, in that case, I'd like to speak next, Chair, if that's OK. Um, look, I've always believed these metres were a bit unfair on the North Hobart traders uh, since that day. Went, I mean, I wasn't on council when they went in, but I, I couldn't believe it at the time, um, particularly given that they didn't go into other satellite, satellite uh, business areas. Um, nothing has really changed since then. Uh, I do have a question um, through you, if that's OK, Chair, for the relevant director or the CEO. Uh, point six of the administrative response on page 301 just states that uh, you know, the investigation into removing the metres requires consideration of numerous factors above those of simply removing the infrastructure. Um, can I just get some clarity on what those factors are down in point yeah. six? Oh. 
Director Allen. Where are you, Lord Mayor? Um, the, one of the issues is the make good situation that would be put in place after the metres are removed. Um, but there are a range of issues to be considered. So, so this goes back to a time period before I was at council, um, but the impetus for installing the metres and changing the parking times was related to um, Uber Eats and other drivers blocking up that parking, the on-street parking in Elizabeth Street and the strategy um, which, based on our numbers, would appear to have been successful is to drive that parking to the off-street parking um, venues that we have, so Condell Place being one of those. Um, so the response really says um, it, the issue needs to be looked at in context of all the parking needs um, in that area, so balancing up residents, businesses, um, the other curbside users in that space, um, and is relevant to the work that's being done through the city mobility team around a parking strategy. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm actually happy to support points one to four of the motion. Um, I think point five is delving into operational matters and we've heard why there was a delay and I totally accept that, these things happen. Um, but given that these meters have been hooded for 18 months now, I just I do think it's fair for us as elected members to put a time frame on the removal. Um, so we'll be supporting that point as well. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Posselt. Yeah, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I, I would echo some of the time frames, time frame concerns that have been raised uh, by the mover of the motion, uh, Councillor Kelly, uh, just in regards to the, if there's a significant petition, there's been ongoing work and there's been delays, and I appreciate why the delays are there, but the delays still exist and we have, are accountable to the community in this instance. Um, just to raise... Um, a couple more points uh, advocating for their removal. Um, I understand or I anticipate that part of the structure plan may include revitalisation of the streetscape of North Hobart. Now, just using logic, um, I would anticipate that as part of revitalisation, if there's any widening of footpaths, if there's any alteration or capital works that are done in that strip, the metres will have to come out, facilitate that and be put back in and probably be moved to whatever location is suitable in the future. So I'm not really convinced on the argument that this is uh, undoing work that won't have to be done again anyway. Um, so why not take them out now? And if we decide that parking meters need to go back on, and then we'll have a good, really good comparative data because we'll have a before after before data um, to compare it to, to then justify putting them back in, should that be required, especially in light of the Uber Eats comments. Um, the other thing is, uh, I actually went on a, a fantastic ride day around the city with the manager of City Mobility uh, last week. We spent four hours riding around all various pockets of, of Hobart. And one thing that we picked up was that uh, there is significant footpath clutter in Hobart, uh, just as a general principle. Uh, from sandwich boards to parking signs to parking metres. And I think that leaving hooded metres indefinitely uh, in the absence of the structure plan, which is coming, I understand that, uh, is probably not the best practice in terms of the accessibility of the streetscape in that particular area. So I think that's another reason why we should take them out, as well as listening to the businesses around. I would propose an amendment to this, um, uh, this particular item, which um, the mover of the motion can opt to, uh, to include in if he so wishes. Um, but the amendment is that uh, existing parking metre sites be considered for a trial of two electric vehicle chargers on Elizabeth Street, North Hobart, and for associated data to be fed into both the parking strategy and the EV strategy for the purpose of informing future strategic directions. And uh, the reason for including this is that there may be an opportunity with the existing infrastructure as it comes out to engage a commercial operator to replace that metre with an EV charger at zero cost to the council. Um, but also, I don't believe that we have any on-street EV charging in the municipality. We have some in off-street car parks. And I think having a genuine trial site in a busy retail precinct could be valuable to inform the decision moving forward. I have heard arguments put to me in the past that uh, if you have a high heritage area with very little off-street parking, people may come down from their homes, charge their car there because they don't have a charger at home and a fast charger, 
grab a coffee, buy a newspaper, pick up their dry cleaning, spend some money and then move on. Uh, and I think that uh, that argument does warrant a little bit of investigation in the Hobart context. So that's the, uh, the background for this amendment and the amendment is supported by the North Hobart traders. So I'd ask that to be considered by you, Councillor Kelly. Uh, further discussion? Any further discussion? Oh, Councillor Elliott. Thank you, Chair. I was um, pleased to attend a recent meeting with the North Hobart traders along with Councillor Kelly, Councillor Purcelt, Alderman Zuko and Alderman Barakas. And it was the frustration coming from the traders was palpable. And I can completely understand that when you hear about the timeframes and you see it yourself, the hooded meters there for so long. And I think I'll be really disappointed if this motion was to be um, deferred. I think it's rare that we have a situation where we have such strong evidence to support the motion. Literally, we have literally installed parking meters and had businesses contact us offering to show us their books with how the meters have decimated their trade. I mean, that's tangible evidence um, available to us. And we've heard from the mouths of the traders that they need action now. Uh, so I'll be absolutely supporting this motion uh, because I think that the council, while we, we do have um, plans and strategies and, and neighbourhood plans and things, they take months and if not years to develop. And we, I don't want us to see us forever using those as a delaying tactic because we need to be responsive to the community. That's our job. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Barakas. Thank you, Lord Mayor, and I'm happy to support this. I know there was a comment about um, uh, due process and, and fairness. As was, as was noted, I, I attended a meeting um, on a public holiday with um, traders. And as was said, the, the, the level of frustration was powerful. And there was a lot of talk about there being very little action occurring in North Hobart. Um, and it is important to, to just note that those reflections weren't on a particular on particular elected members. It wasn't on particular staff because it's an issue that transcends um, those of us that are here. It's it's it was an issue before the, before the last council election um, <clears throat> over over numerous different s staff and directors. It's it's just become um, uh, 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 an issue that I think many traders in North Hobart have gotten used to, um, and. Which is, which is why they've gotten, a few of them have said, look, we feel like we, 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 we raise an issue, it turns into a, it, it pops up in the media, people get, people get ornery. Um, council has a meeting about it, they promise to do stuff, and then a year later it all fizzles out and it doesn't, doesn't get talked about again until we, until we, we pipe up again. Um, the, in regards to the parking meters, it, that it was, um, <clears throat> as was said, in regards to trying to find a way to tackle the Uber Eats issue that was um, uh, uh, unfairly taking up public parking spaces. Um, as I understand, and uh, Councillor Kelly probably has a, a more, a more um, on the ground understanding of, of, of the history there, but I don't think that addressed necessarily the issue in, in, in the most effective way. I don't know if it addressed, addressed it in a way that led to a positive outcome for businesses. If it, if it helped resolve, if it helped partially resolve the Uber Eats issue, which I think is still an issue, um, uh, it also had that negative, in, negative impact on, on, on smashing the trade. Um, I am very, very, and I know I've spoken about this a lot, uh, on point four. Um, I, I do think you know, if, if we have some very large, very visible signs, big blue signs with a P on it, with a digital screen that says there's, you know, 80, there's 20 free spots in, in that car park around the corner of Condell Place, and around the corner there, there's a car park that half of the restaurant goers probably don't even know about on LaVoy Street, soon to be bigger. Um, then it would avoid that issue of people doing blockies, trying to find spots, driving around, turning the whole street into a into a car park during during peak time, um, and clogging up the, that entire street and just turning it into a mess. I think that would actually have a huge impact on helping increase the the the, the flow and permeability of that area because people just go around, do the block, look for parking, don't know where to park. Everybody starts going up and down the street because they don't even know that there's a car park around the corner. Um, I think that couldn't get done soon enough. On the issue of the, the 30 days and the 60 days, I, I do appreciate that there has been delays. 30 seconds. 
I might just ask for one an additional minute. But um, extra minute moved by Councillor <coughs> Postel, second by Councillor Sherlock. All those in favour say aye. aye. Can say no. Carried unanimously. As has been said, there's there's business owners, traders, representatives of the traders that say we've been like we've been like coming to council for years, like more than four years. It's been it's been a large amount, large amount of time. We keep getting told yes, there's stuff happening. There's a, there's a plan. There's a master plan. There's a structure plan. There's something on the way, but we're at that point where they need to know that something's happening and they need to know when that, when that thing's going to happen. And I think we need to stop giving open-ended, yeah, something's coming and actually have a solution that we can respond to um, rather, rather than just, you know, keep asking them to trust us. Because we've done that, and I don't mean us necessarily as in the people in this room right now, but council has said, yes, trust us, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of the issue. And five, six years later, that they're not any better off than what they were before. So I think we do need to earn that trust back with, with those traders, because it is, it's the busiest restaurant precinct in the state. It is a destination, and I think we, we do need to, to, um, to, to show them that we are actually listening and, and responding to the issues that they're raising. So I'd, I'd commend all of this, and I think part five is, is, is actually critically important. Further discussion? Alderman Bloomfield. A view on this. Elected members actually have a duty of care to ensure that any motion that we put through here is based on fact and is established for the greater good. We all know that. But part of this process involves negotiating with not just the staff and directors, but also the CEO of council, not just the local community. So we need to be the conduit, this room, we need to be the conduit between the community and council. So when we make good decisions, we're basing them on structural process. You know, we throw words around like good governance. We we need to make sure that whatever we ask for actually fits. Because I feel that um, when I went forwards to think, okay, we've got another issue coming up, let's go deal with it. Um, I went to the staff and I said, so what have, what's been coming through? And they said, well, no elected members come through. And I was really disappointed because that means we all let them down. This room. We should have been better. We should have been to um, the concierge. Brand new system that we've never had before. We can ask any question. We can put things forward and learn and then bring the information back and educate. Because I honestly think so much of this issue, so much of this pain and there's probably not one person more passionate about small business than I am. But it comes down to communication. If I don't do my research and ask the council, what are you doing, before I go back in to um, the, the, the small business people to tell them, then we're probably only doing half of it. And I feel sadly that this motion echoes that. It's done great heart. It's answering a question that's been asked, but most of what the words at the bottom from the staff say, but you didn't come and tell us. So I would really like to um, answer these questions. I really want to know that there's going to be a great solution. And I very much understand that the parking is a problem in this area. I, was, I remember back in, was it, 2018, uh, being one of the people standing in that new car park that was just being announced, we we're going to develop this place and to discover it's still not developed. It was hor horrendous. But I also didn't ask the question, did I? So we all take responsibility, this room. And then we need to fix it, but we can't fix it by just simply throwing a motion around and going, right, that's it, we're going to do it. What we actually need to do is, is very much, unfortunately, workshop it because it wasn't done via the internal system first before we came here, because then we wouldn't have had to have said that. If we'd actually put this stuff through to council, talked to the staff and got it done, we would be having a action plan today, but we're not because we didn't do our homework. So I really encourage that, yes, this is a great concept. It does need to be addressed. It does have a genuine impact on small business, and we do need a solution. But what we don't need is, is stuff that's just coming through, out of the air, few ideas, but not with the grounding it needs, because that's what we're here to do. We run a city. We don't run anything else, we run a city. 
and we need to do it as a city. So um, I very much um, would be along the lines of putting this through to workshop purely because we have to finish the work, get it right. It still can be done quickly, but we need to do it the right way. Okay, further discussion before I put a couple of these. I've got a deferral motion, I've got an amendment. Um, uh, thank you, Lord, Lord Mayor. Yeah, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I suppose uh, I find that, that um, some of the rationale is a little hard to read, um, and uh, I'm not sure if, if Councillor Kelly was, was the author of that um, or whether it was uh, Alderman Zuko, who's obviously not here and not putting this motion, but um, it just doesn't, in some, it's hard to make sense of it really. Um, but just, just in, and I'll, I'll be, um, uh, I'm happy to be proven wrong. But I, I, I agree as part with part one of the motion that that um, that we remove the parking meters in North Hobart. I think that they've been obelisks um, and uh, clutter on the North Hobart strip. Uh, serving no good purpose. So I, I would suggest that they are, are moved and I would support that. Uh, in relation to, to virtually all of the other points, I find it flies in the face of um, due process and how we might go ahead and doing things. Do we have a parking problem in North Hobart presently? Well, we, we're told we, we have, but quite often, um, and I'm not sure if it's directly, can be directly correlated to uh, the parking meters which have been hooded for quite some time, but um, quite often there is, there is virtually no, no cars parked in, in the North Hobart Strip. But I can't say that the cause, causal relationship between the hooded meters and the parking, the, the lack of cars there is is directly related. I just can't. Uh, I, I don't know if I have the evidence. Do we have that evidence, uh, CEO? Um, through you, Lord Mayor, we actually do have data that looks at movement um, in and around because we've got the sensors that are, are still operating in the precinct. So we know we we could find out, and we have that that information um, available. Then that's good. But whether that is uh, cause and effect because of, of the, the hooded parking metres. I, I think that's a long boat draw. Sorry, Deputy, can, I, can, can we just ask whether the, what the data shows, if there is a, is it on this question? Um, through you, Lord Mayor, I'd need to refer that through for a more specific response from our director, Connected City. There's a range of data that we do collect in the precinct. Through you, Lord Mayor, um, we can get more specific data from the census, but the advice to me is that um, what we have seen is whilst there is a reduction in longer term parking in Elizabeth Street, that's been correlated to an increase in off street parking in Condell Place. Uh, yeah, that's all right. Um, the, the other thing is, um, the suggestion is that uh, the parking times be altered from 8 to 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, in line with other areas. I mean, this is a restaurant precinct and I, you know, like, I don't know what, on what, is it just anecdotal evidence that this is suggested? Is this, is, is this correct? Um, I'm leaning towards a deferral, uh, supporting a deferral motion, but, um, uh, but still with wanting to take the parking metres out. Um, and planned digital signage, well, um, yes, planned digital signage is a good thing, but w over, th over the course of um, last week and beyond, uh, we've done, I've been involved with a lot of the, the Hobart, Central Hobart uh, plan and, and, and getting that information out to the public and, and seeing how interested the pub public have been in relation to the uh, Central Hobart Structure Plan. Having um, a coordinated approach to how we do things uh, in this really important part of, of uh, our city, obviously it's not to, to downgrade the importance of this, but 
we need to do this uh, effectively. I know there has been frustrating delays. However, I feel that that some of the the things, um, the the uh, suggestions in this motion are are really lacking. Unfortunately, I, I feel that they're um, they're not really evidence. Uh, there's not really this evidence approach that we really require when we're making good decisions. Sorry, before you um, step up, um, Director of Connected Cities would like to provide some information to the Chamber. Mayor, if I can just clarify the current arrangements in relation to off-street parking, which is the matter um, referred to in point three. Um, so in Condell Place, uh, parking is currently restricted to a maximum of three hours between 9am and 8pm. Um, with payment to be made between 9am and 6pm. So that is consistent with other precincts uh, such as Salamanca. I hope that helps. Clarification. Uh, Councillor Dutta. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Um, I, I have a few questions to ask first. Firstly, uh, with regards to the staff response, point number nine, um, on page 302. Why, why do you need more time uh, to write a more comprehensive report? Director? The report wouldn't uh, be written by me, um, but the, the issue is, so um, from a curbside management perspective, there's a range of uses that need to happen on the Elizabeth Street um, street frontage. The um, issues to be balanced up are what is to happen, um, so assuming the parking metres are removed and we retain a 30 minute uh, parking time limit on Elizabeth Street, um, that has been put in place as a disincentive against Uber Eats vehicles parking there. There are potentially implications on residential parking um, in the streets around <coughs> the precinct. Um, and we are also anticipating that we'll have an additional 31 parking spots um, in the Lafroy Street car park, which is due to open um, at the end of May. Um, so there's a range of issues, including um, obviously an awareness about the precinct planning and the parking planning and transport planning that's being uh, done through city mobility. So it's, it's in the broader issues that are raised there around what is the appropriate setting for parking in North Hobart in general that we're recommending there's an opportunity to write a more research report. Thank you, Thank you very much. Can I ask, oh, sorry, can I ask a follow up on that one? Would it be um, possible um, for the council to sort of, for example, approve number one, um, but then the other things be um, the subject of a more comprehensive report? Would that, I mean, is it, would removing the parking meters really upset all of those other considerations? Uh, through you, Lord Mayor, that's unlikely that it would um, upset any of those other things. So yes, it could work that way. Um, perhaps while I have the floor, um, I could also reassure elected members that in relation to the parking signs, uh, we do actually have those signs, they've been procured and we are in the process of applying for a development application, putting, um, I guess, animated signs on the side of a cluttered uh, pedestrian strip and roadside is complex. Um, and that is why that issue has taken some time. Too. Okay, uh, Councillor Dutta. Thank you, thank you so much. So uh, just an, a, again a clarification on, on the motion point number three. Uh, did I uh, uh, hear correctly that uh, the parking stops at 6 p.m.? People don't have to pay. So if I was to go there and park, I don't have to pay. Would, could you clarify that please? Through you, Lord Mayor, yes, that's correct. There's no paid parking in Condor Place after 6 p.m. And, and Lafroy Street, sorry, as well? My understanding is that's the same. So if uh, you are there uh, after 6 p.m., will you get fined? Uh, no, you will not. Say that again. 
What, or whatever the... So, 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 yeah, so the three-hour parking restriction applies between 9am and 8pm, but the payment for parking is between 9am and 6pm. Yeah. So that's, that's the off-street. So I believe the issue is in relation to the 30-minute parking on Elizabeth Street. Um, my understanding is the reason that was put in place was to act as a disincentive um, for Uber Eats drivers to be standing for long periods of time in that parking um, and cluttering up that strip in front of businesses. Thank you. Th thank, thank you for those clarifications. Now, it is my understanding that when this motion, this whole uh, uh, argument came here, it was based on the Uber eaters, the, the Uber drivers, sorry, uh, my apologies. <laughs> and uh, the, the point I was trying to make there, that was slip of the tongue like Freud would say, is that in that context it was referred to certain ethnic group of people who go and park their cars there. And that was very helpful. But it was clearly implied that there are certain people who go there. And it was out of that, that was the genesis of it, that this whole thing came into play. And then recommendations were made and then we followed that particular path. Now, when we made the decision at that point in time, evidence was given to us. And I'm sitting here when I make the decisions, I'm reliant of expert advice. I don't have that expertise, nor the data, nor the evidence. Once I'm provided that information and data, I make the decision based on that. So therefore, when that evidence was provided to us, we made the decision what was recommended to us by staff. Now, realizing that, that maybe there was an error, uh, it was right, not right, and therefore I would go along with what uh, Councillor Kelly is saying. It has a psychological impact. I support his statement. Having taught psychology for more than 30 years, I know what perceptions are like. And so therefore, what I'm saying, I would be happy to have number one removed. And I've heard that that can be done. I have no problems with that. But all the other ones, I think we really need to. We have, in fact, found ourselves uh, lapping in here. We don't have evidence. We don't have arguments that are supported in the rationale. And for me to support this is really not a good governance way of dealing with it. But having heard the points uh, from the staff with regards to point number one about removing, I would be happy to support that. All the others I would be happy to defer. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Harvey. Well, since we're all having a go before we put a deferral motion, I might as well contribute as well. Look, I've got to agree with a couple of the speakers, uh, Alderman Burnett, uh, Alderman Dutta, Councillor Dutta, Councillor Burnett, sorry, about removing the metres um, as an interim step before we get the final report. But can I just ask through you to the director, are these metres battery or are they hardwired? Do you know that? I'm sure I can actually answer that question. So the initial advice has been, that's been given to me is that it is not as simple as simply unscrewing the metres from the footpath and moving them. Um, so that is why we're in the process of looking at what exactly would be involved in doing okay. that. Okay. All right. Now that answers my question. So I'd be and, and all the other components of the motion. Also, um, I, I'd rather go off to a more thorough process. Um, it's complicated. And imagine if we went back to the. And as, old, as Councillor Dutta said, I can recall vividly the debate about the Uber drivers wearing thongs and hanging their feet out the window and the state of their cars and a whole lot of really derogatory comments about Uber drivers. Um, and subsequently, 30 minute parking was initiated in the area. So if that was to be rolled back, put in as our part, whatever the time limit, we'd be back to that situation where we'd be um, confronted by the Uber drivers occupying all the car parking again. So that was a really key point that, I've, that, I, that I'm picking up on here. So I'm happy to support a motion for deferral. I understand the complexities of moving, removing the metres. I understand the complexity of waiting for a sign to, be, um, to go through the DA process, which is at least 42 days, plus the development of a proposal, which is complicated. It's not just we take a few photos and stick in a DA. It has to be engineered to fit the, the locations and things. So I'm happy to support a deferral motion when eventually we get around to moving it and that all of these go to the appropriate place 
for further debate or become part of the report that will be coming back to us hopefully sooner rather than later. For the discussion, can I just ask a question of um, procedural question? I've got a um, of Councillor Sherlock. Um, the one one would be whether she would well, actually before I do that, um, is there an estimate of the cost of removal of the parking meters? Not of even like I'm just worried about. For you, Lord Mayor, I don't have that available tonight. Um, even a ballpark, like. Um, I'm just wondering whether Councillor Sherlock um, would be willing to um, can, uh, modify her deferral motion um, to um, items two to two to five um, that would allow people who want to make an in principle decision about um, that the council remove the parking meters in North Hobart be able to be voted on and that the remainder um, two to five be deferred to a workshop you know, within the next month or something to discuss all those other elements, including getting some information about the cost implications of the metres. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Um, look, I think I said before I am supportive of um, having the um, parking metres removed. I do understand that. Um, I think if it gets everybody across the line, uh, to support having um, the parking metres removed and then two to five go to to be deferred. I, I'd be happy for that too, if everyone wants to vote on that. Okay, now, um, before you move, if yep. the, that's going to be moved, you also need a seconder and I also need to, um, we also need to discuss uh, Councillor Posselt's amendment. Um, oh, mo the deferral motion, the modified deferral motion is seconded by Deputy Lord Mayor, but I'd like us to have an opportunity to yeah, thank you, Lord consider Mayor. whether we put number six in the... Yeah, that, that would be my suggestion if uh, it, it is Councillor Kelly's uh, motion, is to include my amendment as point six within it. Um, the only uh, issue I'd raise, just with the, def the deferral, well, two issues actually. Uh, one, just a, a question. Uh, do we need to um, say when and where it's being deferred to? Possibly we can, yeah. Yeah, or do we... Do I did we... say that. I said that to a workshop or a conversations around the Hobart, North Hobart precinct plan. Sorry, no, I did okay. say that. I was trying to clarify <laughs> if we actually need to be more specific than that under the Act, um, because I've certainly... No, OK, good. Um, the second component is that I believe point five was largely being applied to point one in the way that the motion was written in my um, interactions with Alderman Zuko, that... Um, he wanted a time frame in his absence. Uh, he wanted a time frame applied to the meters going, uh, not just a council resolution. So my suggestion would be deferral of points two to four, um, a vote on the amendment and one and, and five. I, yeah, that, that's Councillor Sherlock's yep. decision Oops. as to her deferral motion. But with your um, Councillor Kelly and um, Alderman Barakas, are you happy to um, accept in uh, Councillor Posselt's amendment into your motion about the e-charges? Yes, I am here. Okay, so we've now got a six-part motion. Can I just get clarification on the e-charges? Is it bikes or cars? I've forgotten already. Cars. Cars. In the street. Yes, cars in the street, replacing meters so, with cars in the street because the infrastructure is there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, it's to understand so, if it's useful. Could you just remind yeah. I think you've <laughs> circulated the... I've ten years to <laughs> worry about it. Can you account the amendment so that people are clear on what it is? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Just to, just to clarify with everyone, the amendment, or which would be point six now, uh, reads, existing parking metre sites be considered for a trial of two electric vehicle charges on Elizabeth Street, North Hobart, and for associated data to be fed into both the parking strategy and the EV strategy for the purpose of future strategic decisions. Right. Yeah, look, I'm getting um, Sorry, advice just, from the CEO yeah. about the need to investigate, but I think if, if one to six is in Councillor Sherlock's deferral motion, then it would be, there would be time to investigate it. If I may, if I may also clarify uh, with you, CEO, that the the amendment only says consider, so I would anticipate that would involve a report coming back. Yes, yeah, CEO, please. 
Thank you, and absolutely thank you for that clarification. Um, Lord Mayor, and apologies for giving you advice from the bench, but um, I just wanted to be absolutely clear that the technology may not facilitate it, so I just didn't want to raise expectation in the room tonight that we consider it. Uh, we need to investigate the capacity of the technology to be amended in such a way. So that's fine. As long as we're clear about that, I'm comfortable. And, and perspective. I just needed to be clear about that. And, and Lord Mayor, uh, thank you, CEO. That that is the pure intention of it is to just consider it. And if it's feasible, that we can just simply get a contractor in to replace them and run the the EV charges. That's okay. the idea. So we don't have to vote on that because it's been accepted into the original works. motion. It's not how it works. You want a PowerPoint rather excuse than me, a fifty Excuse meter. me. We're not going to debate it now. Yeah, Alderman Barakas. Ah. Okay. <laughs> So, um, I think we now have a substantive motion that is one to six, um, because it's been accepted in, your amendment's been accepted in by the movers, um, but I've also got a procedural motion for parts two to six, um, so, and um, a procedural motion to vote on one and then to, um, to defer um, two to six. So I'm going to move item one to start oh, with. Six, uh, I'm going to move six. item one to start with to vote on, which is, um, no, actually, first of all, I'm going to move the procedural motion first, I think. Yep. Procedural motion two to six um, be deferred to our, a workshop and a further report. All those in favour say aye. 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 Against say no. Aye. Show of hands, all those in favour. And against? Okay, so that's the procedural motion for two to six. We now have the remaining part of the motion, which is item one, that the Hobart City Council removed the parking metres in North Hobart. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. No. Show of hands, all those in favour. Okay. <laughs> Point of order, Lord Mayor, I don't think interjecting during counts are appropriate. Yes. Oh. I accept that. <laughs> And against? Okay, great. So we will now move on to item um, 21, which is a motion from Alderman Zuko and Councillor Elliott. I'll ask Councillor Elliott to move their motion. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. So I'll um, put the motion as listed on the agenda there. Second by Alderman Barakas. So obviously uh, this motion is complementary or relates as well to the Hobart, um, to the North Hobart area and it also came out of discussions with the traders in that area who are similarly frustrated with um, the security arrangements in the precinct and I'm sure we'll all agree that council has a, a critical role to play in the safety of our city and there's been what appears to be an escalating um, presence of antisocial and criminal behaviour and particularly affecting the North Hobart traders. And some of the concerns they outlined were really um, quite upsetting to hear the frustrations that they're facing and the real life um, risks that they're having to deal with. For example, the traders talked about um, staff being afraid to walk back to their cars of a night after finishing work. And I found that really troubling at the best of times, but to particularly when it's actually factoring into the business's ability to attract and retain staff with such you know, low unemployment uh, rates, it's really hard to get good people. So it's another barrier that our traders are uh, up against. So whilst, of course, security cameras, which is the core issue of this motion, aren't a silver bullet for, uh, uh, for deterring violence, they do have a role to play in terms of some confidence inducing. Um, the other issues they talked about and showed us evidence of is persistent property damage new buildings, uh, new apartments, windows being repeatedly broken and smashed and it's ongoing behaviour. It's not ad hoc, it's persistent that they're um, facing. 
also spoke about, and a lot of us would be familiar with the terrible case of a murder in the North Hobart Strip, and how the traders spoke about the police having to contact the traders along the strip to see what sort of footage they had available. So that's why this, how this motion was born, because it focuses on providing um, or on delivering for the precinct seamless coverage, or as far as we practically can, seamless security camera coverage for, for the strip and also for the um, Condell Place car park. Uh, the traders also raised um, some concerns around the cameras that we do have in place, about making sure that they're constantly um, being managed and maintained. They spoke about an incident at the back of the, the restaurant area on, facing onto the car park where something had occurred and people went to look at the footage and the trees had grown. You couldn't actually see the, what you was meant to see. So the incident was out of um, view, well the view of the camera was obscured by the tree. So I mean it goes without saying that whatever infrastructure we put in we need to make sure that it's um, constantly fit for purpose and this obviously that sort of work takes money and that's what uh, I appreciate that, but for me, the safety and security of our city and also the supporting our traders is an imperative. So I do realise and that there is work happening in this space, as outlined in the admin response, which is great. The matter still remains, though, that it's we need to be responsive to issues. We really have a role to play in terms of making sure that we're proactively listening to the traders, we're coming back with practical solutions to things and we do to ish their issues and we deliver them promptly. Because at the moment, um, it's really sad to say, but the precinct, the traders there especially have lost some faith in us. So I think we need to deliver on action to restore some faith there and in doing so, um, help improve the safety and security of our city. Thank you. Further discussion, Councillor Posselt. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I, in light of recent uh, communication from the CEO and officers, I can't support the motion as it's currently written um, because I know that there's a significant body of work underway uh, to provide enhanced CCTV coverage as well as an asset replacement program for the Condell Place um, CCTV cameras. And so in light of that and having been at the meeting with the traders and understanding their concerns and, and more broadly uh, addressing the issue of safety and antisocial behaviour within the CBD, which has been raised at a number of council meetings since we were elected, um, I would like to foreshadow a motion which is coming to your email shortly. Um, and the foreshadow uh, reads as follows, uh, that A, council officers supply an anticipated schedule of works for the planned installation of CCTV along Elizabeth Street, North Hobart at the next council meeting. And the intent behind that point is to provide clarity to the traders who are requesting this as to a timeline before they have their cameras up and operational, which we're planning on. Uh, no hard, hard deadlines, just transparency. And the second point, B, is that council officers prepare a report considering staffing enhancements to the Safe City Hub to aid in preservation of law, order and amenity within the municipality. And that is as it pertains to some information that was sent out to today about two FTE being appointed to the Safe City Hub uh, and whether or not we should consider as a council enhancing that staffing level uh, to help aid TASPOL and aid in the law, order and amenity within the city. Um, and I'd ask that you consider that as a foreshadow motion. Thank you. Uh, okay, um, so that's considered if um, if Councillor Elliott's uh, motion doesn't succeed. Uh, any further discussion on the motion? I, I just had a question, Chair, that I'd just like to ask. Um, page 304 contains a lengthy list of cameras to be installed. I feel like the foreshadowed motion from my colleague is about the same topic. There are no time frames on that list. Are we able to actually get those dates now about when they propose to be installed? There's, there's about 12 of them. I think a, even a range, um, D Director Allen? Yeah, through you, Lord Mayor, the project is anticipated to be completed by the end of this year. It involves um, putting conduit and uh, cabling up Elizabeth Street and the installation of the cameras, but it is expected to be done by the end of the year. Uh, question to, uh, for the director. 
do the, does the installation of cameras need to be done in sequence? If we're putting cable in up Elizabeth Street, I'm assuming you can't just run the cable straight to North Hobart and then cut into it later. Um, how does it work? Uh, through you, Lord Mayor, I, I can't go into the um, technical details of how that's uh, installed tonight, but you are correct, it is in sequence. It needs, to be, um, it needs to be rolled up up Elizabeth Street as we put the infrastructure in that allows the camera footage to be, um, to be transmitted back to the Safe City Hub, which is in this building. And it's a wire, sorry, it's a, it's a wire connection, not a wireless connection? In, in most instances, yes. Okay. Um, look, I appreciate the intent of the the, uh, the motion, but it's getting head of the program. So council is committed to getting this done. It's work in progress, and I think we just have to be patient. We can't jump the queue because it doesn't make sense. Because if the cable needs to be rolled out, and if the if the cameras need to be installed in sequence, then so be it. And I can assure council that what's being installed are really sophisticated devices. They're not the quality that we probably see, you know, when you get the criminal, the villain with the blurry face. You know, these are high quality, high definition sort of cameras. They're, they're complex, that, that, that's true. So it does take time, as I understand. I've watched them install cameras in Salamanca as well. It's a complicated process. It's an expensive process. So I'm happy to, I, I, look, you know, not, not support this because we are in the process of doing what's being suggested in the motion. We just have to be patient and we've been assured that it will be completed by the end of the year all the way to North Hobart. So that is, gives me confidence that we're doing this work and we don't need to expedite bypassing most of the city to put it straight into North Hobart. Uh, Alderman Barakas. <clears throat> um, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, on the, on the topic of patience, I think the, the, the salient point on this item and the previous item is that I think traders in North Hobart have run out of patience. But, look, I, as, as was said, um, I was one of the elected members that attended this meeting with traders um, a couple of weeks ago, and, and, and this issue was, was brought up as a, as, a, as a really significant one. And I, I do remember the, top of the, com the, um, the mention of the camera that was obstructed by overgrown branches. Um, there's there's talks of you know people climbing up and getting into the buildings through the through the ceiling and climbing up the side of windows and ending up in the in the roof in the um, the shop tops of, of, of shops and running amok inside there or you know, violence on the street and it's it is an ongoing issue broadly in the city but between the CBD and the North Hobart precinct they're two of the busiest areas that we've got in the city. Um, there was the top Councillor Harvey did mention about the the quality of the cameras. Um, and I, I do note, as, as is in the officer's report, there is a, a, a current rollout in, in that area. Um, how broadly does that, through you, Lord Mayor, how broadly does that rollout go? Um, and, and, and the reason I ask this, because um, just in, in recent times, there was a, a couple of months ago, there was an incident in um, um, Franklin Square here, and I did raise, ask the question about whether or not there was any prosecution made against people that had you know, committed crimes in Franklin Square, and, I, and the advice that I got back was that they looked for the camera footage and the, the footage on the cameras was insufficient to, um, to action anything. So if, if, if um, you know, we talk about inner city, high visibility, high traffic areas, um, I'd, I'd hope that we, the cameras that we have are of a sufficient quality to actually be used in prosecutions and to, to achieve those goals. So, sorry, sorry for the lengthy question, but through, through you, Lord Mayor. Uh, sorry, Lord Mayor, I, I've, I'm assuming the question is, um, are the cameras of a commensurate quality? Um, yes, they are. So, in setting up the Safe City, City Hub, we actually looked at um, similar CCTV camera setups in other capital cities. So, we looked at Melbourne um, and also at Perth. So the technology is current. I can't speak to the specifics of that incident in Franklin Square. Um, it's not going to be possible in all instances to capture all things um, on the CCTV camera network. Um, 
but I, I do believe that we have scheduled a workshop in the foreseeable future with elected members to talk about city safety and security. Um, and it would probably be a great opportunity for us to do a demonstration for elected members of the CCTV camera network um, and what it is capable of and how it works. And we would be happy to do that. And, and just, to, just to confirm, the, the quality of those cameras that we talk about being, being of a high enough quality Obviously, the new ones that we're putting in are, are the existing stock of cameras at, at, at a sufficient quality. Yes, they are. So we have supported the police in numerous prosecutions um, using our CCTV camera footage, and it's absolutely been fit for purpose. Okay. okay. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Further discussion, Councillor Dutta. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Uh, once again, you know, I sit here uh, wanting to make a decision based on evidence and facts. And when I read the staff uh, points that they've made, I refer to number six, and it reads, given the numerous issues raised with the city through various channels by traders, not only the traders though, there's a comma, patrons and residents alike, and the complexity of those varying issues, it is considered appropriate to receive a comprehensive report from office, council officers on this matter prior to making a final decision. Now for me, you know, the motion is fine. Uh, we want to do what uh, our people request. But again, for me, that is bringing in the concerns and from a governance point of view to go sit through it to say, okay, fine, I'd love to do it today or even yesterday, but I'm not able to because it is a complex matter and running a city is a complex issue. It is not like running a uh, cafe that I do, that's peanuts. I mean, we can't take that uh, experience and compare it to running a, a council. It, it is a complex uh, institution, an organization that we have here. So for me, if the council officers are saying to me, you need more report, a comprehensive report, there are numerous issues, it's not here in front of me to make the decision. And therefore, I would wholeheartedly go along with what the expert staff are recommending and saying to me, and that is also in the Act, that we should be given that advice from the CEO before we make the decision, and that is not given to us. Thank you. Question. Um, can I just ask um, one question? Uh, it's at the bottom of the point one. Um, just to seek clarification, it says that um, we spend $700,000 just in North Hobart of the CCTV network. So it says we committed to build to $200,000 to build the infrastructure to connect North Hobart to the city's um, CCTV network. This is in addition to the $500,000 allocated specifically to North Hobart from the $880,000 we received in federal government funding. So are you suggesting that um, so North Hobart received five, 500,000 of the total grant we received of 880,000, so quite well and potentially over-serviced compared to other parts of the city in terms of the uh, funding allocation. Uh, through you, Lord Mayor, I, ca I can't really talk about the potential of the over-servicing. Um, the, the allocation of funding is correct. Um, part of what we uh, are hoping to achieve through the planned CCTV camera network was to set up the, um, I guess, the, the base infrastructure, which is the Safe City Hub at Town Hall, and then run um, kind of channels of um, infrastructure. Um, it was a significant part of the federal government funding allocation and, and the application that we put in that we run that program up Elizabeth Street. Right, great. Um, yeah, and I, I, um, I feel some sort of connection to that um, federal government funding because I lobbied for it, um, I think in 2020 or 21, um, when we were in Canberra. And um, so even though, like I, I you know, I can see the great benefit that um, CCTV networks do provide to city safety, but I think people should be careful what they wish for because there's also a huge movement of people that are very sceptical about what they consider to be smart cities um, and they're very worried about these cameras looking <coughs> at people and are they going to restrict freedom. So before too long we'll probably have a big crowd of people uh, in, the, in the chamber telling us not to install CCTV cameras. But look, I think the information from the, um, 
from the staff clearly demonstrates that we've got a very significant program. It's already um, you know, heavily investing in North Hobart. In fact, North Hobart's getting a very, uh, the lion's share of the, the federal government funding. Um, so this motion is just kind of mismatched to the advice that we've been uh, provided. Um, and I really would encourage people to you know, find out some information from officers before motions are put together because that would have revealed that you could have gone back to the traders and provided them, you know, still, still listening to people, still servicing your constituents, but providing them with the information that actually is available inside the organisation. Sometimes it's hard to get information um, and we do have to wait a little while, but I think it's, it is often worth it um, because it's very clear that this motion is not required. Um, the, the, the program is happening uh, and the investment in this precinct is well and truly, um, you know, a, a, the lion's share of the, the money we've got. Um, and we just need to ensure that when we're listening to traders, we're listening to traders from all over the city as well. There are traders everywhere. Um, and also there are different views amongst traders, even in some precincts. So let's not sort of pretend there's one amorphous trade of opinion about everything. Um, and, and also that we've got a whole range of really important precincts that we need to ensure we're spreading the resources and the, the policy love uh, right across the board. Okay. Can I um, sum up, sum up please? Sum up. Yes, thank you. Um, I did make attempts to get information related to this motion, but I don't have much luck when it comes to timely information. I had a response um, back at 2.30 today on some of my questions, so I did make attempts to get information. Um, I just wanted to note uh, very quickly that the motion actually in the first line does call for that a report be provided. Thank you. Okay. Um, just one other small thing in uh, relation to North Hobart, a lot of the conduits in the upgrade that was done in the um, North Hobart revitalisation program in about 2008, they put a heap of these conduits in the ground already to anticipate this. So a lot, but perhaps North Hobart could be expedited in the whole thing. I don't know, but your records will show. I was there and I've got pictures and putting them in. So a lot of that hard work's already been done. Great, thank you. All right, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Hey. Against say no. Sure. no. Show of hands. All those in favour? Robin Barakas, Councillor Elliott, Councillor Kelly. And against? Councillor Sherlock, Councillor Purcell, <coughs> Councillor Loberger, Alderman Bloomfield, Councillor Dada, Councillor Harvey, Deputy Lord Mayor, Lord Mayor. Uh, the motion is lost. Three votes to eight. Now we're now moving on to my motion, um, and I'll just ask. Other motion? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, so. Got to reread it. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. This again just goes to address the uh, the concerns more than anything, um, and consider opportunities for how we can enhance. So the amendment just reads. Uh, a, council officers supply an anticipated schedule of works for the planned installation of CCTV along the Elizabeth Street, North Hobart, uh, at the next council meeting, uh, which will be public and transparent for the traders to know so they can hold us accountable should those works be delayed and we can ask some questions if that's the case. The second point, uh, B, council officers prepare a report considering staffing enhancements to the Safe City Hub to aid in the preservation of law, order and amenity within the municipality. Uh, and that's just a report. Okay. Um, so I need a seconder for that foreshadowed motion. Um, Council uh, Alderman Bloomfield. Uh, discussion on the foreshadowed of on the new motion. Councillor Harvey. We've heard that this all occur. Um, it should be complete by the end of the year. So that for me is good enough. Um, and to put a time frame on each camera. I think is a bit arduous for you know, the, the staff, especially if you get held up. And I don't know how fast the rollout of this might be, but technicians have to be available, technology's got to be installed. So I, I'm, I'm not supportive of this. I think we've, we've heard that this is happening and that's enough for me. Um, part two, enhancing the, the Safe City Hub. Um, most of that stuff's recorded. We don't have people in there 24-7 watching 
hundreds of CCTV cameras. C CCTV is not about stopping the villain at the time, it's about recording what's happening in the city. But it's not just about safety, it's also about all of the other things that a city needs to know. How traffic moves, how people move, uh, we can count cyclists going up and down roads around corners. So the CCTV network is much more than just you know, surveilling people. Um, it helps cities function in the best possible way by being able to provide data. And, I, and one example recently of the, the network was when a, a child was lost and in the city and the CCTV system was able to locate that child because the, the um, inputs you can put into it are quite sophisticated. So there's a lot of um, benefits of having this system that are not just about the security but about how we manage a city. Um, so, and whether we need people to monitor, t monitor that, I don't think it's necessary because it's all happening 20... You can't have people there 24-7 and you can't monitor all of the CCTVs at the same time, but if something does happen, there's a record of what has occurred. Further discussion on the motion? Uh, I, I just have Dutton. a question uh, uh, through you, Chair. Um, with regards to having that kind of schedule from an officer's point of view, is it realistic? to have such uh, a, a, an element in that motion? This is part one of the motion, yeah. the schedule. Um, uh. Uh, through you, Lord Mayor, we would be able to provide that schedule. Um, uh, as was pointed out, um, sometimes there are unforeseen circumstances that mean we don't meet that, but um, we can provide the schedule. Thank further you. Discussion. Any further discussion? Uh, okay, I'll put the foreshadowed motion. Oh, sorry, the motion. Did I have a seconder? Oh, yeah, Alderman Bloomfield. Uh, all those in favour say aye. Aye. Again, say no. No. Show of hands, all those in favour. Alderman Barakas, uh, Councillor Basilt, Councillor Loberger, Alderman Bloomfield, Councillor Kelly. And against. Councillor Sherlock, Councillor Elliott. Councillor Dutter, Councillor Harvey, Deputy Lord Mayor and the Lord Mayor. Uh, the motion's lost five votes to six. Okay, we are now moving on to the third motion for tonight, um, which I need to, do you want me to, do you want to sit here or do you want to just be the chair? Uh, be Come and sit here. Come and sit here. Just do it from there. <laughs> So thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, so actually, um, so this is a, a, a motion for councils to support an Indigenous voice to Parliament for us to have a position on this. Um, I have a seconder. I do need a seconder. I haven't got one at this stage. Councillor Sherlock. Thank you. Councillor Sherlock. Um, so the motion uh, really came about um, because uh, I've been seeing a lot more activity in the local government space um, from cities who have, uh, who have very strong records of Aboriginal reconciliation, of truth-telling, of supporting the Aboriginal community uh, and of supporting historic progressive change in the country. Uh, and a lot of these cities have passed motions recently to support an Indigenous voice to Parliament, to support the Uluru Statement from the Heart. And I think it's important to recognise that the Indigenous voice to Parliament referendum is one step identified by the, uh, by the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which was a, a very significant piece of work that took many, many years and a lot of deliberation and discussion amongst a very broad a group of Indigenous representatives to come up with and it really was presented as a gift to the Australian people to say this is our this is our hope that you will join us and the voice is the first step in that uh, in that um, Uluru statement but it's not the last step the the, um, the statement talks about the voice being the first step and then other steps being treaty and truth-telling that follow that and so there's a real um, logic to the, the um, pathway that the, the country is going on and the referendum to support the voice 
is really a significant part of um, all government, both local, state and federal, recognising the importance of um, Aboriginal people being recognised in our constitution uh, and being um, genuinely uh, consulted by all governments, uh, regardless of who comes into parliament, there will have to be a voice there all the time. Uh, and that's the significance of having uh, the voice recognised in our constitution. Uh, I do, uh, it's a, it's a, the motion is um, a fairly simple one. It is based on some of the other motions that have been passed by, unanimously by a number of cities around the country that have decided to, that they want to be part of this discussion, they want to be a positive part of the discussion, they want to um, not just sit on the fence or say that's not our business, but they want to show that they are local government leaders on this historic discussion. Uh, and it does recognise that there are a diversity of opinions in Hobart um, and that those opinions um, about this referendum are diverse from the Indigenous and the non-Indigenous community, but I guess we often as a city will make a call on a decision that, on an issue that we think is historically important, that we think as a group of elected representatives is important um, that we make a stand as a city. Um, this mo uh, very similar motions have been endorsed unanimously by very politically diverse councils, um, including the City of Sydney, the City of Melbourne, the ACT government, the City of Newcastle, uh, the Inner West Council, the whole of the local government, New South Wales, like our equivalent of Legat, has supported a very similar motion. Um, the New South Wales government, obviously. Um, the Municipal Association of Victoria, which is our, the, um, the Victorian equivalent of Legat, um, which represents um, hundreds of uh, councils in Victoria have um, passed a similar resolution. Uh, the, uh, the city of Ballarat um, in WA, the city of Fremantle, um, Bayswater, Vincent, the Shire of Denmark. In Queensland, the local government association of Queensland has supported a very similar motion as has the Northern Terri Territory government. So, um, we know that the Tasmanian government has support, is supporting the voice, um, but we would be the leaders in terms of Australia, um, local government in Tasmania by um, passing this motion. Um, so I do hope that um, colleagues will get behind it and support this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, discussion. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor and Chair. Um, Look, I acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, uh, Lutruwita and Nip Nipaluna, the Palawa people, and I acknowledge Aboriginal people and their ongoing struggles with poor health and social outcomes associated with war arriving on these shores. I acknowledge the healing that is ongoing after children and lands were stolen from the original people of this land. I acknowledge the hurt caused when governments ignore sacred history many thousands of years old to build highways and bridges but redirect works around colonial cottages. And I acknowledge that small acts like the removal of the Crowther statue are significant to the Palawa people and important for healing and note that in stark contrast to this city's meaningful actions, the Premier's office on St John Street, Launceston, continues to display a tablet placed in 1942 commemorating Abel Tasman's discovery of an already inhabited island in 1642. The Uluru Statement from the Heart is an historic moment and I fully support the three key proposals. A constitutionally enshrined voice to parliament, treaty and truth telling about Aboriginal history. I note that not all Aboriginal Tasmanians are supportive of the voice and acknowledge their frustrations that enacting the three principles in their entirety are unlikely to occur in a timely manner. Treaty will lead to healing and we must tread the path to treaty carefully, deliberately and with purpose to ensure the right outcome is reached for all Australians in the right way. I believe that the 2017 National Constitutional Convention at Uluru was the first step to healing and treaty, and the statement from the heart the second, and the referendum on the voice is the third key step. Without these steps, treaty is unlikely to be achieved so I walk this journey with you, the people of Hobart, hand in hand, and if you stumble on the journey, be sure that I'll be there to pick you up and continue down the road to treaty together as one community. I welcome ref the referendum as set out by the Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, and note the federal Labor government's continued push to recognise and work with Aboriginal people in a more meaningful way. 
I also note Premier Rockliffe's support for the Yes campaign. In fact, I note the tripartisan support for the Yes campaign in this great, great land of Lutruwita, Tasmania. And I encourage you as Australians, Tasmanians and Hobartians to support the Yes campaign and to talk with your friends and family about doing the same. This is an historic moment and we must get it right. 30 seconds. I ask my colleagues to not just support this motion, but to consider how the City Council can contribute to reconciliation, treaty and truth-telling in a more meaningful way in Nipaluna Hobart. And that's why I'll be supporting the motion this evening. Further discussion? Councillor Kelly. Um, I've got a slightly different opinion to some of this. The referendum, as I understand, it's a ballot. It's a private vote and it's based on democracy. Democracy and a private vote is exactly that. Tonight we're being asked to ask what our personal opinion is and nail our colours to the mast here. Um, it takes away from the, one of the very fundamental pillars of democracy and that is the private vote. So that's, that's one point I'd like to make about that. Secondly also to the referendum is not going to be held possibly as late as December. Um, I'm still gathering all the information I can. In fact, the government is not going to list, uh, post out to all the uh, voters the yes and the no case, which under the Electoral Act they have to do, until it, it, they can leave that as late as two weeks before the actual election. I'm following this case quite closely. Uh, there's constitutional lawyers arguing the, the, the case to and from, uh, to and for the whole uh, poll. So I just think this is way, way too early for anyone at this chamber here to be able to sit down, look everyone in the eye and say, I know exactly the decision I'm making here tonight is the right one. We just simply, seven to eight months away from when the referendum is being held, do not know that information. I challenge any of you to stand up and tell me the pros and cons of it in a very educated way. I guarantee there's probably no one here that can give me that definitive answer. Therefore, I propose that this matter is deferred to a later date when we can all sit down and make a very, very responsible and a very important decision on this matter instead of something that's another eight to nine months away, possibly nine months away. Well, not nine, but eight months. So that's what I'd like to do in this instance, Deputy. Thank you. We, I hear your deferral, but I, I also want to hear um, discussion, so... Uh, um, could, uh, yes, because I haven't quite finished as well. The other thing I wanted to make, apart from that, was there are members in this chamber here tonight who have aspirations for state government. Now, they, if they don't follow the state government line for the party that they uh, intend to possibly run for, this puts them under enormous pressure. They might have a personal uh, opinion on some matter like that, but having to declare publicly right now that they are going to have a different opinion, I, I question that. So this, once again, it's another fly in the ointment to, to it. I have no real problem with the whole concept of what's been happening in that, but once again, it's coming down to the due process of what this way the council is going about it. There's my big problem with it. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion? Alderman Bloomfield. I actually look forward to the day that our relative communities form a treaty and walk together. I really honestly do. That's part of what I really look forward to. But when I'm here, I'm here to uphold the Local Government Act. I'm here to represent to the best of my ability. Just that, that's my scope. The referendum is federal. And honestly, I find that I'm being asked to effectively use the influence that I have in my community to push for a political view in a federal world. I, I find that that is abuse of what I have here. I don't think it's the right way forward. I genuinely would love to see a treaty. I really want to see good things happen. But I feel that this is not the way it should be. I will be abstaining because I believe that is the only choice that I have available to me because I will not say no and I will not say yes because 
like um, Councillor Kelly, I, I have yet to work out what the voice in fact means personally and right now all I have for anyone here is a personal view. I have nothing professional because none of us have anything additional to what anyone else out in the street has as far as information on this goes. I would love to do more but I simply will not because I absolutely value what I have here. I value the integrity and I value the influence that I work so hard to ensure does the right thing for everyone. Thank you. Councillor Lowberger. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Lord Mayor and Chair. Um, like my colleagues, Councillor Kelly and Alderman Bloomfield, I'm a bit uncomfortable about this motion uh, coming to the table, um, simply because we are a local government body and it's a federal issue. However, um, so saying that, I, I am going to be voting yes tonight, just in the hope that this is one step along the pathway to true reconciliation. Um, I, I feel like voting no would be the wrong thing to do. Um, and so yes, I just wanted to let us all know I'll be voting yes despite my discomfort. Thank you. Any further discussion? Alderman Barakas. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. We did just hear on previous Oh, Deputy Lord Mayor, sorry. Um, we did just hear on previous items that we are, you know, in the spirit of good governance, we need to be here making decisions based on facts and, and, and research and, and, and proper advice. And as Councillor Kelly said, there's this, this debate's still being had out by constitutional experts. Um, there's, there's considerations on either side of this. Um, and so we, we, we're getting asked to take an official policy position on, on a pretty big issue, a very important issue. As, Council, as Alderman Bloomfield said, well outside the remit of, of council, um, that will have huge ramifications for, for the country. And it's very early into the piece. The vote's not for quite some time. The, the, the information's still coming out. The, the conversation's still being had um, by experts. And Councillor Kelly also made an, another really good point, um, uh, which gave me cause to think, us taking a position on what is a democratic vote. It's, it's a democratic vote, it's a referendum. Everyone's gonna go there with a yes or a no in a ballot box. Um, and we're here debating whether the city of Hobart, which represents everybody in, that lives in this city, has a formal position on this is akin to us sitting here in a few months' time or a year's time or however long time and saying uh, this council is gonna move to take a formal position on whether or not we think the Labor Party or the Liberal Party should win the next election. I, I, I don't think that is an appropriate way for us to be, not only be using our time and the resources that it takes to run these meetings and, and fill out these reports, um, but it's also not a appropriate way for us to be exercising, as Alderman Bloomfield said, the, the privilege um, of the decision-making power that we have here as representatives of this city. Um, I will just correct something that the Lord Mayor said. I think it was, um, I think it was stated that the state government has a formal position in support of this. I think the Premier is in support of it, but he issued a, the statement was that every um, every member of the party was was able to exercise their own conscience on that, so there wasn't a formal position as far as the, the government um, supporting it. But no, I'll, I'd also be abstaining from this. I don't think it's an appropriate to take. I don't think it's appropriate to take a position on this as a council. We all have our uh, individual views on this, and many of them are strong views. Um, but we represent the entire city, and there are a range of views, even amongst the Aboriginal community, on this. And I don't think it's appropriate for us to be putting our flag in any particular trench on this issue. Thank you. Councillor Thank Elliott. You. Um, I'll be quick. I'll also be abstaining because I simply don't think it's our, our role. It's a referendum for a reason because it comes down to individuals and I think we're um, kidding ourselves if we think that people actually really care what we think about it, the Hobart City Council. I trust the community um, to make up their own mind and without interference from local government and like uh, Audemars Baraka said, there's, there's not even a unified um, uh, perspective from within the Tasmanian Aboriginal community and there's still legalities being worked out and being heavily and importantly debated. 
and uh, yes, no, I will be, this is from my perspective outside of council's remit. Councillor Kelly, did you want to say something else? Uh, yes, is that possible? I'll just said one yeah, more. Mate. No, that, that's another. Make it a question, please. Oh, make, make a question. Uh, may I say another uh, national related question? <laughs> the other final comment I want to make, it's been just touched on. You can't, you can't, you can't speak, you can't speak you can't twice. Um, <laughs> no, actually, the couch is. There you go with asking a question. The inflection at the end, that'll be. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a good decision <laughs> that we. Uh, here as representatives of our community. Oh, I, think, I think you should probably sit down. Thank you, thank you, Chair. I usually don't write uh, things. Um, I usually just speak from the heart and when I hear people, I respond to that. But uh, let me make some contradictory, uh, introductory remarks first. You know, more than 100 years ago, Gandhi became the voice for the voiceless in Africa when he was booted out of the train. A number of years ago, Desmond Tutu became the voice of truth-telling and reconciliation. What I've written here is this, that this is an issue of great significance, not just for our country, but for the First Nations people who have lived here for tens of thousands of years. The voice to parliament is not a radical concept. In fact, it is an important step towards recognizing and respecting the unique perspectives of indigenous Australians. The voice would provide a means for First Nations people to have a say in the laws and policies that affect them and their communities in an advisory capacity. For too long, our First Nations people have been excluded from the political processes. This has led to a lack of trust and sense of disempowerment among the First Nations people. The voice to Parliament, in my view, would help to address this by giving our First Nations people a platform to express their views and concerns. Furthermore, the voice to Parliament would provide a way for non-Indigenous Australians like me to learn more about the experiences and perspectives of First Nations people. This would help to build bridges and foster understanding between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. I understand that there are concerns about the practicalities of implementing the voice to Parliament. However, these concerns should not be a barrier and a hindrance to progress. With the right resources and support, the voice can become a reality. It is time for Australia to take a significant step towards the reconciliation by recognising the voice of Indigenous Australians in the Constitution. This is an important initiative and to work towards building a more just and equitable society for all. 30 seconds. May I have another minute, please? Uh, moved by Councillor Posselt, seconded by Lord Mayor. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? Adams carried. Thank you. More than uh, 2,000 years ago, there was a voice from the mountain called the Sermon on the Mount. This is a sermon from the rock called the Uluru Statement from the Heart. It is a cry for recognition, for reconciliation and redemption. And I endorse the points made that this is only a passage. It is a route. It is a means to get to treaty. And for that reason, I will be supporting this. I totally understand and agree it is a private matter. And because it is a private matter, I conflicted for a while. And then I took my position to provide that leadership. And therefore, I am happy to vote for it. Thank you. That's Sherlock. 
Yeah, thank you very much, um, Chair. Um, just a few things I'd like to say, just to point out that um, the Act does say in our role as councillors we are to act as advocates for the community. So we have taken various different positions on various different issue, uh, issues and it is within the Act that we're allowed to do that because we're acting as advocates for our community, while it may be a federal matter. So that's just clarification number one. Um, number two, when, when it was stated that um, <laughs> This motion would be like equating um, deciding who <coughs> will win the next election, Labor or Liberal. Really? It's, it's the same as this? We can equate those two things? Yeah, look, I don't think so. Number three. Uh, this is not, we, we not, not everybody has a unified voice. Yes, absolutely, granted. Oh, look, at point number 1.4, the motion actually says that. It says, acknowledges that there is a diversity of opinions inside and outside Aboriginal communities in Hobart and across the state and country. Right there. Point 1.1 .1 is talking about reaffirming the city's uh, commitment to truth telling. Actually, that's part of your role as a councillor. We said that in our, um, in our action plan, Aboriginal commitment and action plan. Oh, look, we're just reaffirming it. That's what the motion says. You're going to disagree with that? Okay. 1.2 recognises that Australia has formally endorsed the UN. You're going to vote against that? Okay, sure, your call. 1.3 notes that the Commonwealth Government's commitment to the Uluru Statement from the Heart in full, including voice, treaty and truth to the referendum, you can read it there. And once again, I'll say the same thing. Really? You're going to vote against that? That's, that's the Commonwealth Government. 1.4, I've already outlined that. 1.5, talking about supporting. Sure, it will be your personal vote at a referendum at the federal level. Maybe it'll be different to the way that you vote tonight. Who knows? But that's your personal choice. But don't forget, please do remember that as councillor, it is your role to advocate for the community as well. And, this, and the motion here from 1.1 to 1.4 is talking about reaffirming, recognising, noting and acknowledging. And if you want to disagree with that, that's your choice. Thank you. Further discussion? Councillor Harvey. Thank you, last. Yep. Um, Chair, referendums are notoriously bad at passing. Most of them have failed. I think it's only been eight out of about 40 referendums that have ever got up in Australia. Uh, and that's because there's normally been polarisation. The, there's been a for and against or member, uh, the different political parties have taken opposing sides, which we have at the moment with Liberal Party opposing, Federal Liberal Party and Labor supporting. Uh, the Greens also support. Um, so if you don't want the, the um, referendum to fail, then you need to take a side, I th we need to speak in favour of it. And I don't want this referendum to fail uh, because there's a high chance that it will fail. Therefore, for me personally, it's important that I take a side and I make a stance. And I, if I can encourage the council to make a stance as well and hope uh, people do vote in favour of this motion, then hopefully this referendum might pass. And I do get that there's a lot of um, you know, opposing views. And I did discuss this with you probably a couple of months back. You know, my views on on this and I've switched backwards and forwards but I've decided that I'm in the camp now of supporting a voice to parliament even though there's opposition from our Tasmanian Aboriginal community some of our Tasmanian Aboriginal community but I've decided that it's important that I do pick a side and that I stick with that and I hope that this council can support this motion as well everyone has a right to bring a motion to council as the Lord Mayor has done tonight and we've had some interesting motions over the years some really erudite ones like the ones I always bring, and then there's other <laughs> completely wacky ones that have um, gone nowhere. So there's a range of motions that have come through here. Tonight's a good motion. I support it, and I hope that we get the numbers around the table tonight and that this council commits to taking a, a positive view towards a voice to parliament. Thank you. I'll, I'll rise to say uh, a few words uh, about this. Um, Initially, Lord Mayor, as you are aware, I, I did not want this to come to, to council because um, at that time I felt that it wasn't appropriate for us or necessary 
uh, for us as uh, elected members, as Hobart City Council, to put our position forward. Um, and it's, that wasn't about sitting on the fence. That was more about having, allowing the community, as Councillor Kelly has said, to have that discussion, to get to a point where they can make a decision for themselves based on the information that they have. I um, was asked to, to be part of a group which is advocating for the yes vote. And uh, as a group of, uh, of uh, mainly women who, uh, who are across the political spectrum, who feel that they really must see this, this referendum, must do whatever is in their power uh, to do uh, what they can to get this yes vote up. Because this voice to parliament is so important and it is a gift. Um, from the Uluru Statement of the Heart, from the heart. It is um, something that we uh, are, have been provided by uh, a, a long-standing uh, culture uh, and, and many leaders who have, who have um, deliberated on this and provided us this opportunity yet again, but certainly it looks like uh, Australia is poised to take that. So I think that is something that we, we as, uh, a, uh, our community, as community leaders should be leading on, on this. So I will support it uh, tonight um, uh, because I think it is something that we need, need to be strong, uh, strongly heard, um, heard uh, in relation to this. We know that the polling, if um, the Sunday Tasmanian uh, can be, um, is suggesting that the, the polling suggests that the, the yes vote is on the decline. So uh, this is timely. So I, I do welcome uh, this, this motion. Um, didn't in, in the past, but certainly feel that it is incumbent on us as um, elected members to support this. Can I just ask a question? Yes. Um, I was just wondering if it would be okay to actually split those motions, you know, one, two and three, you know, all the way to five. That way it gives others the opportunity to actually vote for certain parts if they do feel like, yeah, look, I think it is time we reaffirmed the City of Hobart's commitment and then didn't want to vote on the last part, if, if you'd consider that. Lord Mayor? If people would like to do it that way, I'm happy to, as long as it's nice and quick. Because <laughs> I know it does take more time to count the votes if there's a... Uh, okay, well... It's your call, Chair, on that one, but... Look, we'll proceed as, uh, as it is, um, but we do have the, the notice from um, the, the um, deferral motion from Councillor Kelly. Councillor Kelly, are you still wishing to put that? Uh, yes, Deputy. Do we have a seconder? <coughs> Alderman Barakas. Okay, without further ado, I'll put that motion. Those in favour of aye. deferral? Say aye. Those aye. against? No, say no. 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 Show of hands, those in favour of deferral? <laughs> Alderman Barakas, uh, Councillor Elliott, uh, Alderman Bloomfield, <laughs> Councillor Kelly. Those against? Councillor Sherlock, Councillor Purcelt, Councillor Loberger, Councillor Dutter, Councillor Harvey, the Lord Mayor, the Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, that motion is lost. So we go, seven, go seven, to the substantive four. motion. Uh, Lord Mayor, do you want to summarise? Um, no. Probably don't need to. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So um, if there's no dissent to putting it um, forward as one, I'll put the motion. Those in favour, aye. say aye. 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 Those against, say no. Well. OK, show of hands. Those in favour? Councillor Sherlock, Councillor Purcell, Councillor Loberger, Councillor Dutta, Councillor Harvey, Lord Mayor, the Deputy Lord Mayor. And those against? Those against? 
Abstaining. Is against. Would be Councillor Barakas or a no, Councillor Elliott, Councillor Bloomfield, and Councillor Kelly. Data, I thought you voted in favour. Councillor Kelly Count abstentions is a is a no. Or? That's yes. right. wrong. So of the no's I've got, no's or abstentions. Councillor, sorry, Alderman Barakas, Councillor Elliott, uh, Councillor Bloomfield, and Councillor Kelly. So the the motion is carried. Final item for our open agenda is just questions without notice. Are there any questions without notice uh, for the open portion? Uh, there being none, uh, we will have a motion. If we have a motion to move into the closed, uh, moved by Councillor Harvey, seconded by Councillor Sherlock. All those in favour of moving into the closed, say aye. Aye. Again, say no. Carried unanimously. And five-minute break. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so we'll just have a quick pit stop break and um, come.